Good morning and thank you for joining us this lovely Saturday morning. I am Alero Idu saying welcome to Sunrise. And I'm Ayo Makinde. Good morning and welcome. Hope you've had your breakfast in bed. I'm just saying. You know. Well, um, somebody added another to our cocoa oh. or cocoa. Um, there's also the third one, um, cocoa. <laughs> oh God! How is Coco different from Coco? Coco. <laughs> anyway, how was your week? <laughs> now well, I have a riddle for you this morning. <clears throat> now you remember that snake? Yeah, well, which that's one? ate some money. Oh, that one. Yeah. And the monkey. Yes. And then the termite. The termite had been busy as well. So the question now is, so which of them is the richest? The easy way to go about it would have been which of them stole or ate stole the most. The most. No. No. Ate, 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 ate the most. Okay. okay. However, it's easier these days. Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> if you stole physical cash, uh -huh. it's a lot more difficult. Okay. But if you but took what, the what, money... One of them did. That's the thing. That okay. one is not easy because you can be easily found. But if you but electronically stole money... This one was not found. The money was not found. He swallowed everything. You're still not getting it. If you don't, you know, somewhere. <laughs> you know, and I go for me too, I'll be go somewhere. Mm. But the one that you don't, you just, you just, is the records of the money that are stolen. And that one gets sense pass. The time ah. is, because it's e money. The tiniest of them was. Sorry, e naira. <laughs> e naira. I stole e naira. But that might. one is really easy. That one is, you get sense, so ah. you try, you try. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Well done. That one is easy. I mean, he's e-money. He's, he's the one that you decided to... No, 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 to... no please. E-Naira. Sorry, sorry. So, e sorry, no, no, no. E-Naira is Nigeria's um, E-Naira. But he stole Naira electronically. Huh. You know. And huh. so they are the... Well, maybe... Is it to say that they stole or took the money or they took records of the money? I don't even know what, what we're saying there. But the long and short of it is that, is that the money is not there. The money is not there. Thank you! And it is, the, it is because of what the termites did. The termites conspired. <laughs> let me... <laughs> let, let me... My partner is becoming a lawyer. <laughs> Conspiracy to yes. steal. Yes. With human That's another beings. crime. With human beings. When hmm. in the days of... In the days after Adam, it was human beings conspiring with angels. Now, it's termites conspiring with human <laughs> beings. So please, who is going to sue the termites? And where exactly is the termite? No, you need to first of all prove. You know, it's the human beings that said the termites are responsible. And, and it, then the termite will come out and say, I didn't do it. I didn't, I you know didn't, the, tiff, the, I didn't tiff the paper. You know the thing that I'm afraid? One of these days, the animal kingdom will come out and protest. You people, I've been lying against us because the the monkey that stole money has not been arrested. The snake, the snake that stole money has not been arrested. The termites that have been allegedly accused. allegedly accused. Sorry, no, no, they have been accused actually, but they have been alleged to have, to have been responsible for the loss of plenty money. Is it that one? Is it even in naira in dollars? I forgot. Those, Naira. those animals, mm. one of these days, mm. if we are not careful, the animal kingdom will come out and protest. It's like the devil. Everything is the devil. It's the devil. The, 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 so the, the devil came out one day and said, eh, 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 leave me out of it. So I was busy minding my own my business. business. So let's, let's be careful mm. how we mention the name of animals in our business. I'm a business. You know, <laughs> I feel quite embarrassed talking about this, that a whole nation can be saying things like this, and the whole world is listening to us saying stuff like the snake ate it and the monkey ate it. 
And if these snakes and these monkeys eat huge sums of money. Hilero, I will not put it on the nation because it is, we are also in the nation we are calling this preposterous. It is just some human beings in the system who do not want progress, who do not want things to be done properly. In this digital age, where young Nigerians are selling their tech, com tech companies for hundreds of millions, millions of, of dollars. dollars. We are saying, you know, some people are still going around with vouchers for money in billions. So what is wrong with us saying that, look, let's transform the entire civil service. If you cannot do computer, go home. If you cannot Simple. work with technology, go home. Yeah. That's what I think I, I understand uh, Mr. Fashola did when he was governor of Lagos State computerized the entire system. But yeah. Whether or not we still have papers going from table to table, well, we could still have that. But don't let your first call mm. be paper. Yes, For I, God's sake. I remember a few years ago, we, we used to watch programs on towards a paperless office. Imagine. We've been talking about uh, cashless policy now for how many years? Well, we're still at it. And we're still talking about money being stolen by animals in jam office? Yes. Sometimes you try to pay electronically and the people tell you, well, the alert's not a quick come, so I prefer cash. There is a hospital in Lagos. They don't do transfer. Government office. Yes, I know that hospital. They don't do transfer. Yes. Whatever you want to do. And they don't do to, POS. They don't do POS. You have cash. to bring cash. Yeah. To Cash. a hospital, yeah. somewhere around uh, Ujuelegba. <laughs> <laughs> they know themselves, not far from Ujuelegba. Oh, God. <laughs> they know themselves. And it's a federal <laughs> government institution. The same federal government that is pushing a cashless economy. The same go federal government, you know, institution that is, the federal government that is pushing a cashless society. And that's an MDA ministry department. Is that a ministry department? I don't know. Well, something under the federal ministry of health. So, and they do not do electronic financing. Oh, yes, they're going to write paper. It's easy to destroy paper. And why won't Tamites go and... Chop the paper. Anyway, I don't know. <clears throat> oh, yes, our daily <laughs> <laughs> fuel subsidy. That was big in the news this week. And we got to hear that uh, <laughs> the amount of money spent on subsidy every day is about 18.39 billion it, every day. It came from the mouth of the Minister of Finance. No less. Budget and National Planning. No less. So, <clears throat> and um, there is... It's got to be the tr truth. Some background to that and all of that. Of course, the response from the chairman of the House Committee on, I, I don't remember the name of the, the office, the, the committee. committee. The chairman said, doesn't see how this makes sense. And I don't know any Nigerian that does. You know, the moment I heard that money, oh. that amount, I tried on my... Calculator. Calculator. <laughs> Multiplied by what? For 30 days of a one year, no. which one are you looking at? 18.39 billion naira times 365 for the year i assure you if you try it now you are likely to get e error <laughs> 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 because how much how many zeros can your phone take yeah you yeah. know so some of these things just look and please don't try your calculator your calculator i don't know but you can try it. let's know what you, no, think, you have what a big one that can take about 10 zeros. Well, yes, the big ones, but not your phone. Can your phone do that? Well, except you have some, you know, really massive phones and all of that. So, oh boy. Uh, and <clears throat> for God's sake, there are those. Hello. What do you think? Just, just a second. Mm. We have heard of, quote unquote, illegal refineries in pockets of areas in the Niger Delta. Yes, yes. Done by my people, human beings. Not termites, not snakes, not monkeys. And guess what? They only thrive because people patronize them. Yeah. In other words, it is not rocket science. You know, let's decrypt this whole rocket science. Thing. And also, it means that that petrol that they're refining has not been doing damage to cars. Has not been do doing damage to cars. So it is 
possible. Yes. That's the point. It is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Rocket science is something that has to defy the, the law of gravity until it gets out of the <laughs> atmosphere and all those things. So you need all kinds of permutations and calculations in order to be able to achieve that. This does not need rocket science. That's what it means. A rocket has to go. Anyway, you understand what I'm saying? Into space. So the <clears throat> point is, it is possible. Do we need 18.39 billion naira to, for, did they get, did they need 18.39 billion naira for those quote unquote illegal refineries? So if they didn't need that, just, doesn't that tell us that it is possible for us to have smaller refineries that will not cost us 18 billion naira in one day? Come and on, I'm almost certain, and I'm, because at the end of the day, it's, it's as a result of importation for God's sake. And also connected to all of this is the issue of crude oil theft. And I keep saying, it's not Ayo who is stealing the crude. Because those vessels that take this crude, I mean, they are massive operations and they are, they, 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 they cost a lot of money. So it's not the kind of money that Alero has. Alero. That she's going to be stealing crude. This is Ayo Makinde speaking like a novice who knows nothing. I don't know anything, but I can say this. Every um, pint, for want of a better word right now, of Cruise. crude oil that comes from under the ground mm. is recorded by the people who bring them from under the ground. Sure. Put them into a particular tank Vessel. or pipe or whatever. Mm -hmm. How is it stolen? It is impossible for that to be stolen without some people knowing about it. And you, when don't, there was, you don't steal them and put in your pocket. So, there, and then, for God's sake, we're, we're not talking about so maybe just one liter or two liters here. We're talking about tank loads. It's not possible for anything to be stolen without government knowing about it. Mm. That's my belief. Because I have confidence that government has enough, strong enough infrastructure to protect itself. Right. So, uh, one other thing that's, that we need to talk about, which may or may not need fuel, is the Lagos Blue Rail. We're waiting with bated breath for that to take off. And the cheering news is that they're going to test run it in December. In December. In other words, it'll be concluded, completed. Something for us to smile about, we that's, hope. That's not just smiling. We hope, we hope. You know, uh, when we, when we, when we uh, raised it earlier in the week, my first... You forgive me for my pessimism and for being... Because uh, my fear is, look, we always have, have good things. I remember back in time when government put rails along the bridges, along the roads, and mm -hmm. all of that. What mm -hmm. did some people do? They uh, vandalized and used to make hangers. And spoons. And spoons. Banda. And guess what? I don't know if anyone was arrested. If they were arrested, I don't know the result of it. Mm. So that's my fear about this. Um, um, someone, what, what do you think people could steal? The seats? It's in, not the, the stealing. <laughs> it's not the stealing. It's the vandalization. It's the oh. use. Look at, look well, at the, the, the media. No, no, no. I, I, I'm sure that they will have CCTVs on board these trains. Mm, that's it. The CCTV is not stolen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really am sorry. Uh, Governor Farrell, I'm sorry. But, you know, it, it, we can't, the, a lot of money has been, you know, spent on this, whether it is borrowed or it is from the government. Of course of it's government. borrowed. You know, it mm. is a lot of inf investment. I hope we have also factored, when we spoke about it with the governor, when we hosted him some time back, he's very excited about it, the, the prospect what? of it, and not naturally so. But for God's sake, uh, anyway. Um, where are we starting from this morning? Uh, where we started, we're in Lagos, so we're, we're going to start in Lagos. Let's talk about devolution of power. Huh? I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, we've been talking about restructuring, and that's one of the highlights yes 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 so, yes uh, mm. let's talk about look at nigeria's situation in the devolution of power story then after that of course uh, very aptly we'll just turn our focus onto the aviation crisis i mean that is becoming something really really big it, I mean, it's happening all over the world but it's more so in our country mm. uh, let me let me leave it for now then the 6th Nigeria mm, International mm. Film and TV Festival is also coming up uh, today. What's that about?
Find and out. and then you know we've just we recently introduced our lifestyle segment. Today mm -hmm. we'll be looking at dental hygiene. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and the artist of the week today uh, is a uh, Shim. Oh, he. It's a, you, he. He's a he. Um, I can okay. tell you that for a fact. I know that for a fact. Okay. But you know that some he's usually have features that are... Uh, anyway, don't look at me like that, please. We'll be back after now. Get your <laughs> cup of cocoa or cocoa or the new one. Cocoa. <laughs> I'll be a plate see, of cocoa. See you in just a moment. <laughs> I looked happy enough in that video, mm -hmm. and I'm looking for the day that we're going to be looking that happy at the local government level, which is something that we've always talked about and stressed on Sunrise. We're looking this morning at devolution of power. Well, everyone who talks about this says that that is the best way to go. Mm. Devolve power. The center is too powerful. The center is too strong. Give the states more power, and especially give the local governments more power. Well, the law has given them more power, but in practice... Another thing altogether. Perhaps even now um, that the constitutional review process is ongoing, 12 states have deliberated on the local government autonomy, financial and administrative autonomy bills. Mm -hmm. Ten of them have passed. Lagos has said no. Ikiti has said no. <laughs> For now. <laughs> that's news. So, I mean, that's like an update. So, Thank um, you for that update. And I think we need about 24 states to say yes. yes. So, our journey has just started. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, we have with us a legal practitioner, Mr. Chima Naji. Remember him? The man with the proverbs. Well, he's here with us this morning. Good morning, Mr. Naji. Good to see you again. Good morning, my pleasure, Alero. And on my left, I have Hi. Mr. Noro Edokwolo, a social commentator. Good morning. Morning. Always a pleasure. As well as Golahan Olojedi. Good morning. Good morning. Nice well, to be here. Both social commentators. Now, let me start with the lawyer, sir. We've been talking about devolving power, devolution of power, devolution of power. Um, how easy or how difficult would it be legally to actually achieve that? Nothing is so easy or too difficult under the sun. Thinking fueled by motive makes it either difficult, impossible, or easy. So when you hear somebody is determined to do something, there is a motivation to achieve that result. It becomes easy because you must find that one single reason out of 99 why those things will fail. You look for one reason why it should succeed. And that's why organizations make progress. In the situation of Nigeria, devolution of powers or power, as the case may be, is a highly emotive thing. Very, very emotive at the so-called leadership level. Because it involves a lot of contrivances, some of which are mirrored in ethnicity, religious bigotry, social stratifications, and all manner of bifurcations. And these things make the thing complex and almost impossible, or look impossible. But it's a simple thing. In your family, devolution of powers, the man had always been said to be the man, uh, the person that should fetch for the family. The situation is changing. In fact, it has changed willy-nilly, willy-nilly. But the man who goes out to fetch knows that he does not have all the time to go to the kitchen or does not have the culinary prowess to come out with the best dishes. So he concedes that to the wife. 
it, it will look odd for the man to go to the market to start pricing tomato and all the soup condiments, even if he's doing it for love. It will be misperceived as he's a stingy man who wants to monitor the woman of the house trying to uh, cut corners, so to speak, that he wants to monitor her that she's cutting corners and so on, even if he's doing it out of love. So devolution of powers has always been a very simple thing, ordinarily, if it is, you know, well, uh, thought you through. Know, let me just quickly, because I think there is a need for some kind of historical perspective to yes. where we are, which tapers with what you, um, the analogy you gave of the man yes. and the woman going to, I'm not sure that some men will agree with you, Mr. Edopolo, for here. For they have the right to disagree. Yes, because <laughs> he, may, he may be the better cook in the house, mm. <laughs> and the wife would, you know, agree with he, that. But the, the he point he might have to, the capacity to do that, but mm. he does not run through that that is what he will be doing. No, no, I understand what, I think what you said, you know, it changed willy-nilly because, yes. and it is something that happened mutually. Exactly. Understood well Absolutely. by the two parties, no, no acrimony over Absolutely. it, whatever. So, historically, we didn't always have problems with the local government system. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember the, I didn't know the, I grew up in the 70s. I didn't know the governor of Lagos State at the time, but I knew the environmental officers that came around. I knew in Lagos, we called them Willy Willy. I talk about it all the time. I, I knew those ones in particular because it, we didn't have, the only fridge we had then was pot, clay pot. <laughs> they would come, look in your clay pot if they saw tadpoles, that pot was gone. So they did their bit to protect the people. Mm. They were from the local government system. Yes. So the local government was that effective at the time. They had powers. The officers had powers to do everything they needed to do in agriculture. Extension service officers had their work cut out for them. No, they didn't, they didn't need the authority or order of the governor mm. or body language the of federal government or of the federal government to do what they were supposed to do. So at what point did we topple that system such that we now have to be talking about something that was not a problem before? That is why I use the word decidedly, contrivance, because up until 1977 or thereabout, the local government system that you just described was working. It was the responsibility of states, as it were, to manage local governments as administrative units. If you like, create 100 local governments depending on your capacity to manage the entire gamut. Some local governments in those days, so-called, they had the community um, uh, associations and so that were socially organized in such an efficient manner that if anything was decided at the state level, it got down to the family level that same evening. And people were bound to do it because they, they had, like you said, you related to human beings. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know who, is their local, who their local government chairman are mm -hmm. today. They never saw them. We we'll never see them anywhere. Mm -hmm. So at that time, when the military decided, and you remember I used the word emotive. I used the word contrivance. Mm -hmm. All these are words that are charged psychologically. And you can interject. You can interject heinous intentions, and that is what we have, so that you create imbalance. In an attempt to create this discomfiture for some people, you also ultimately hurt yourself. So what we find today is that local governments were created to give some manner of hegemony to certain people. You find that Lagos State had problem with, uh, uh, under Tinubu, had problem with uh, Basinger's uh, federal government. Mm -hmm because it was absolutely unjustifiable for Lagos State with the population it had to, to be made to suffer such organic disadvantage when you place it with Kanu that did not have as much burden to bear. Now, what did Tinubu do? He decided to take the mantra. And of course, the federal government descended mightily on him. 
The rest is history. But we still find that that hedge money is growing. And it has to do with revenue. You cannot be taking from the pot more than what you decide, what you have ever been putting in that pot. Mm. It is called inequity, injustice. That's why I said maybe as we evolve in the discussion, mm. because I, I, I have to be mindful that I am not alone. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lajade, more and more the, the call for devolution of power seems to be getting louder. Right. Especially in the area of security. It's not just about funds now. Um, the police is federal, the army is federal, everything is federal. So a problem, a security problem arises in some local government in Lagos, for instance. You have to wait for action to be taken from Abuja. Um, in your view, are these calls, do these calls have merit? And is, have we got to the point now where we have to consider this seriously and begin to take action? Th th thank you for this question. Um, and, and I will start with an example. Some years ago, the contract for securing pipelines was taken away from a gentleman called Tompolo. Um, some things were not going right. It was in the media yesterday that apparently that same contract has been returned to him. What could have played out in that nexus? It is what you're talking about. Crime is local. So the people, in fact, I, I used to have a colleague back in my banking days. Emeka grew up on Lagos Island. Emeka will call, even, even those guys with you know, that are already drug affected. He knows their name, he knows their father. And he will call them, and this guy was a banker. But that was where he grew up. If you go into Lagos Island with Emeka, he will be asking for their daddy, how is daddy? How is this? This is to tell us that crime is local, knowing the people is local. If a stranger comes to my environment, the chances that that man from Abuja will know him uh, more than I do. He's, 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 he's slim. He's slim. He's not slim. He's almost absent. Almost absent. <laughs> so, <laughs> we... Slim, for, for that slim. <laughs> you slim, you can still see slim. Mm. We are also beginning to see things like regional security structure emerging. Mm. Yeah, the Ebubiago, the uh, Amoteku. Mm. Uh, before those ones even came, which were regional, we have had certain state-level ones especially in the Northeast and in the Northwest, where people were saying, look, we as the locals must participate in the security of our environment because we know our environment more than anybody. So it's a genuine concern. And I think the, the, the cry for restructuring based on insecurity, I think insecurity and revenue are actually the biggest factors that are driving it right now. It's a step in the right direction, just that we cannot do it in the half as that manner in which everybody is declaring this and declaring that. Mm. It has to be a structured approach. <laughs> half as that manner is very dangerous. I, I take you also back to the question that I asked him. At what point did we begin to, it was never a problem, it wasn't a problem ab initio. Let me use a, a scriptural reference. In the beginning, it was not so. <laughs> <laughs> so at what point did we topple and or toggle it such that we, it has now become a, a problem. Okay, I, I think the, the, the root of the, of, the, of the problem had to do with taking the country as a whole, unitary. Uh, the 1966 event, the military came to power. The way the military structure runs is different, totally different from it's a democratic environment. Uh, forgive me, sir. Yeah. Uh, while I hear you, yeah. and I have had this discussion, so many people have said that, but I'm not going to ask you the follow-up question to your... To, to the, I'm going to ask him. It's been 56 years since that process started. The process of, uh, what, you know, uh, what did we call it now? Unitary. Unitary uh, system of federalism. government. And it's been 23 years, right? Mm -hmm. into this uh, republic 
republic, the fourth republic. We've had the second republic since that time, lasted about three, uh, three and a half years or thereabout. We've had the third republic, even though it was botched within about a year or so. So it would seem like we were, we're not even thinking about restoring things to the old glory. This is the, the longest of it that we've had. It's been more than 20 years. Yeah, so I mean, so what has happened is that those who are at the helm of affairs are enjoying it the way it is, so they've maintained it, all right? So the military left, those who took over, even though they were not soldiers, they liked the way it was. It was, it was working for them, and so they've continued. And, and that is why, for me, Nigerians must recognize that if we do not take back our country, these guys will run us to the ground. So that's my answer. But then it doesn't solve the problem of devolution of powers. Devolution of powers will come when a new set of people take over the, the realm of, of rulership who are not, you know, it's like it was started by this group of people. They handed over to this group, and this group are enjoying it, so they've maintained it. If you check, it's the same set of people who've been passing the button around themselves, all right? So they have, is, Nigeria has been a cosmetic country. We've been military ever since. All right? <laughs> the uniforms were changed to Agbada, but the mentality has remained military. Why? Because it works for a few people up there. All right? And so they would continue because it, it favors them. It's in their interest. Haven't you noticed that when it's corruption, we're of the same religion, the same tribe? Haven't you noticed? <laughs> you know, when it's time to, you know, cream Nigeria, we forget our differences. We are one. So the, the way forward to deal with this is to get a new set of people in who have not, you know, put their hands in the cookie jar prior to. <laughs> Otherwise, come don't, next year. Don't forget that the cookie jar is very, very beautiful. It's a precious bride. And that's why... But it's, it's not, lean now. It's lean now. Lean. And even the little that is left there, the guys are not willing to let go. You know what? I, if I'm going to play on that lean analogy, yeah. I'm going to try to go the way of... Uh, uh, Chief Naji this morning. All you need to do is fertilize that tree. And then it will produce more and it will get fatter again. But let me come to him. Let's just hold <laughs> let me come to him. Um, we, there is a, you said the process of devolving powers is easy. Depending on how. Mm. But legally, what are the legal structures? Do we need extra legal structures? to achieve this ease or what we have already is sufficient? There are legal impediments, yeah. serious one, constitutional, to devolution of powers. And they were contrived, I use that word again, <laughs> because the, the, the people who were in power or in authority foresaw a situation where what they did could be undone. So they put those minds. You have to achieve like to third percent, uh, to third of uh, either states mm -hmm. or local governments as co presently constituted. And you know it is almost practically impossible Possible. because these things are not based on reason. Mm. Even we, we were witnesses to the fact that some local governments even some legislature say they don't want autonomy, they want to be slave to the governor. <laughs> Is it not in this country that we saw that? You would imagine that everybody who is in bondage, who realizes is in bondage, would want to escape that bond, mm. drop that chain, and shout hallelujah. But they depicted one thing which summarizes what I am saying now. A little child of three years was holding a, a, a horse on a string. And the horse was happy to follow the child instead of just doing like, oh, and then run away. Because it had been habituated mm. and psychologically comfortable. Mm. That is what is happening to Nigerians. Which is why till tomorrow you will see people contesting, why should you want to change the people that are hurting us? Because hurt has become psychologically yeah. Normalized. acceptable. Yes. Normalized, yes. Now, yeah. to go straight to the question, because I just I feel that I just made a general 
statement. The constitutional impediment is that there are things that must be done by the legislature. It's not you and I talking on TV and then we walk away with the opinion survey that everybody wants it. The handful of people we sent to Abuja. Who sent themselves to Abuja? We, well, well let's, <laughs> let's, let, we, have, we, have, we have acquiesced. <laughs> we have acquiesced. If an armed robber took your wristwatch or asked you, uh -uh, this watch is fine, no? He brings out his gun. Uh, is, is it, you, you may even ask him, you like it? <laughs> Take it. Take it. He said, thank you, you're a very nice man. <laughs> but I like this shoe to go with it. Too. He said, if it is what you want, now. Take, Take it. it. <laughs> it's only when he has gone one kilometer, we say, hello. <laughs> you see? So it will, if he had a camera, it would look as if you were giving him a gift. And somebody might even say, you're a very kind man. You mm -hmm. had to walk barefooted mm -hmm. after giving. So that is Nigerian situation. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the law is so complex mm -hmm. that you can't even create local government, mm -hmm. additional mm -hmm. local government. That's mm -hmm. why some of us who are seeing beyond the shenanigans mm -hmm. have been consistent in saying that the local government, we don't need it to be captured in the Constitution. Yes. It's not supposed to be one of the federating units. Yes. The federation, you know, is between the states and the central government. If you want to create one million local governments, Go ahead. it is entirely your business. Yeah. The, if, if you have a fissiparous attitude, the more you create, the more you alienate yourself from governance, the more the people want to boot you out. But, how do but you what we have today is a highly depersonalized process. You don't know the local government chairman. In fact, people kill to become the chairman. Mm -hmm. Some governors never allow the election to take place for the fear that they will lose access to the till mm -hmm. that comes straight from the If we go by this example that you're giving, uh, that you know the states should take control of their local governments and be able to do what they would like with it. But even now, Going by what uh, Mr. Lojere said the last time, um, that all crime is local, mm -hmm. all insecurity is local, the local governments are the way they are now, they share the same um, pot of soup, as it were, the same you know, accounts with the, the local governments, the, with the states, yet the states do not fund them the way they ought. So what's the assurance that they're going to do what they should do if it's left entirely to their women caprice in the states? If you legislate, that this should happen to Mr. B. The person will present a facade of following that law because he has now been deprived of his own initiative. He can carry the money, okay, and give the impression that the local governments have not been working. He will sack the chairman that he, he put there mm -hmm. and there will be turnover of people there. But if it is something that must come from him, he will be held responsible. That governance at the local levels are not work. It's not working. I don't know whether you, because this money from what we have today come from Abuja. Mm -hmm. And they bring it to the state level for them to share. And somebody has to sit on this and say, because you ask for your own share, is it your mother's money? Remove him. And the man is removed. If you even want to go to court, you will remain in court forever. Oh dear. Oh. You will remain in court forever. Do you agree with him, uh, Mr. Lojedi? Significantly so. It's a fairly complex place. Um, Nigeria, the Nigeria we have today from a revenue perspective, it's like having a six-cylinder engine for which only one of the cylinders is working. It's working. Mm. So you see 36 states commissioners of finance, every month they go to Abuja sure. with their cap in hand sure. to mm. go get money. Money that they did not work for. Mm -hmm. But money that a few states have put together significantly so and put at that center. It's a disincentive in itself to having a robust economy. Yes. Because mm. I know that once I have 10% of the money I'm going to spend, I'm fine. I can mm. go to Abuja and get the remaining 90%. Mm. So, Apart from insecurity, economy remains a critical reason 
why we must think in the direction of devolving power and getting all these turbines to turn rather than a few turbines turning and then the rest are hanging on to what comes mm. from those places. But, 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 but Norwa, this pot at the center is getting leaner and leaner. I mean, for obvious reasons. So those who are the ones generating the funds that go to the center, for how long do you think they're going to be happy with this arrangement? Especially seems it's, since it seems that their powers are dwindling. They are doing all the work and bringing all the money that is being shared, and yet they have no say in how it is shared and what comes to them. Thank you very much. It actually helps me to... Um, I, I think that, you know, for me, I'm looking forward, and this question helps us to go forward. I think that Nigeria, the constituent parts of Nigeria, should stop waiting for Abuja to bring about change. They must begin to initiate change from wherever they are. I'll give you an example. River State versus Federal Government, VAT. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, Tinumbu's uh, uh, LCDs, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. If we are going to wait, if you think that at some point, people will sit down in Abuja and do the right thing. I'm sorry. So we must begin to demand for the right thing. Go to the courts. Test the Constitution. All right? And so this is really where this conversation should be going. Governments, CSOs, citizens should sit down and say, what else can we chip away from these guys? What else can we cut off from these people? Let's go to court. Let's challenge this. Because... Abuja is not about to let go. So if you think that at some point the people in Abuja will sit down and do the right thing. You know, I was in my 20s when Shoyinka said his was a wasted generation. And I said, oh, God forbid. I'm in my 50s now. And I'm almost saying the same thing. You haven't yet. <laughs> I'm almost saying the same thing. So my, my, my point is we need to begin to chip at the Nigerian constitution from different corners and different angles. Okay. Otherwise... <laughs> Let me ask you, on, on, on the back of that yeah. you know, issue that you just raised, we're talking about devolution of powers. Yes. To the federating units. Yes. Let me make this a little more... Should I use the word complex or dynamic? Uh -huh. How about devolving powers cross-generationally? Again, mm -hmm. it, it goes back to, and, and again, thank you very much. You're just, you know, you're taking me to where I want to go. Um, I'm in my 50s. I'm happy I'm not taking you away from Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even praying to be another 50 in Nigeria, another 50 years on earth. So the guys who are in their 30s and 20s who have the power must make sure that next year they vote not on uh, tribe, not on religion, religion. not on any of those things, but on competency and on track records. Otherwise, they will be lamenting in their 50s if there is still in Nigeria. I'll stick with you and still raise this issue. Yes. There's something that I've argued in my head over time mm. about this aspect of this conversation. Um, in the 60s, in the 50s into the 60s, mm -hmm. the young men and women who fought for Nigeria's independence, as I said, they were young their 20s largely mm -hmm. 58 59 or thereabout or maybe 56 i don't know when i don't remember when asked that we want nigeria to be independent and they got it what did they have in my opinion they had education maybe their parents didn't have education at least western education the way they had it at the time so they could speak intelligibly with the colonial masters who listened to them eventually under 10 years and got Nigeria to be independent. Today, the young people, what would you say is their competitive advantage over their parents, which they have and use? I, I think that, thankfully, I think our young people are suddenly coming to a realization that they have what it takes to bring about change, all right? NSAS was a watershed moment in many dimensions, all right? And so I think that um, um, we have educated young people, but for a long time, they didn't give a damn, all right? That's what happened. They just 
carried on with their lives. You know, I mean, with my laptop, I can make money. All right? I can work for anybody abroad. But now you can't do that. You, you can't work for anybody abroad. You can't get your money. So they are beginning to realize that whatever is happening in Abuja has a direct impact on their pockets. So I think they are, they are coming to realization. And all I can say is that they have for, it's almost like a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring about the Nigeria of their dreams. Whereas the people you spoke to had to go to London to mm. go and bring about change. This time around, they just need to take a stroll to their polling centers and do the right thing. The, the, the issue I'm raising is that of their competitive advantage. On the olden days, they had education. Today, uh, Mr. Lodge, they would say that maybe the young people have technology. technology? And they have numbers. And Huge they have numbers. numbers. Yeah. Okay. Huge. Now, I have also seen, uh, well, I could be wrong, and I hope I am, but what I have perceived is that most young people don't, they're not interested in the things that can institutionally bring about the change. News, government, all those things, generally will seem like they're apathetic towards them. Stranger. They were apathetic. Were. Stranger. They are waking up. Mm -hmm. When you look at the recent uh, INEC uh, new registration, you see the chunk of the people that participated there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And today, the political engagement we're seeing online, mm -hmm. a lot of young people are involved. Mm -hmm. So um, while they might be apathetic in the past, I think that is changing. Up. And I'll be happy. The question that I want you to speak to is, and uh, Mr. Uh, you know, um, Dr. Law spoke about them, you know, making the right changes, right selection, and all of that. But in terms of mentoring these people to do the right thing, how should we be going about it? Uh -huh. Because it's, he, uh, uh, Mr. Naji spoke about emotive action as opposed to factual and realistic action. Do you understand? Um, generally, people just fly with the next information available, not necessarily exploring and exploiting them to ensure that we get, okay, these are the information that are, that are out there, these are the real facts, and this is, the, this is the decision we need to go about it. Who and how should we be mentoring young people to ensure that they do not vote on sentiments or emotiveness or just the mood of the moment, but on sustainable decision? The media has a huge role in that. There is, there is no doubt. Because, see, for young people, they are even more emotive than, they, than the older people. Yes. And they could easily be led in the wrong way. Absolutely. So it is the duty of the media, I would say, Civil, civil, civil uh, uh, organizations, mm -hmm. and as, as, as well as the INEC in itself. INEC has a role in what you call voters' education. Mm -hmm. You know, so guiding these people to move discussions away from emotional issues to the substance, uh, what I call critical matters of state. As it is today, if you ask me, for most of the candidates, I don't even know where they stand on the critical matters of state. What has dominated the scene and not the subject well, matter that we should be discussing no, thus Mr. far? Mr. Lodjade, yes. uh, remem remember that campaigns have not really taken off. They're not taking off yeah. until next month. So let's just hope <laughs> that we'll get to hear about all these things mm -hmm. you're talking about right. when they take off mm -hmm. next month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. So Hopefully. Cut, cut them some slack for now. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just uh, uh, add to uh, the response to that question the difference or the advantage the current youths have over their parents or vice versa. Yeah. The educational system of those days is not the same thing as we have today. <sighs> Even though today it is more technologically driven, the content of technology is higher, which has even imposed some degree of mental laziness. Mm. Because in those days, if I ask you 44 times 3, you will get a sheet of paper and begin to bet none. Ping, pong, pong, pong. <laughs> it's equal to, and you move on. In fact, you can be moving on while you are pressing the thing. Now, philosophy was taught. Yeah. Every human being must have philosophy of life. The old academics, if you may not, the philosophers, thinkers, they had a vision on certain subject matters. So when we hear people like Plato, Aristotle, and so on and so forth, they had visions about how society could be organized. 
the political philosophy of this person, philosophy on religion, this and that, you have some ideas, okay, which will be ingrained in you to form the person. What has happened to Nigeria is that the, the generality of most of the leaders, outside Zeke, Awo, and perhaps uh, Amadou Bello and all that, who had their own little uh, revision and those who had their own higher vision and so on, but they had visions. Outside those ones, it is bread and butter. Yeah. How to take advantage of yeah. the other. Stomach infrastructure. Supremacy, mm. something. And when you even see that in terms of content, Absence of you have nothing. Yeah. Yet you want to affect the context. It is the content that affects the context, not the other way. Never. If you don't have anything in you, you can't change your environment. You will be dancing. That's why paper, if you put it now, it will be wafting. Because it has no mind of its own. Hmm. The breeze goes west, it follows it. And that's how Nigeria has been going this yo-yo. We have never made any progress. If we, like ne ne electricity, you may have one week supply, and you say, ah, thank God, the next two months, <laughs> you don't see any bulb unless you have a, a generating cell. So that is not how to grow society. The educational system has become even more bastardized because there are no longer, some people will say if you teach religion. Let me tell you, some people are Christians, but they are authorities in Islamic religion and vice versa. Yes. So when the people like Abiola will be telling you I, I was a Baptist, some young ones today who have been so badly indoctrinated will be surprised. Does it mean that Abiola, if not that he was a figure that was very well known, his religion was known, but he lived beyond his religion. Mm -hmm. But most of today's leaders are caught in the cleavages of those primordial uh, uh, stupidities, if okay. I should use them. Which unfortunately... Use that word. And it's affecting everybody that claim to be their followers. So gullible, we, as Okay, we, let, let's round off quickly now. Um, yes. How do we transit? Because there are pockets of people who are talking about this. Uh, the governor, Shei Makinde, is talking about it. Uh, former governor, uh, Bisi Akonde, is talking about it. Ulisa Bakuba, former, uh, yeah, well, NBA human right, uh, former NBA president, is talking about this devolution of power. It's essentially talking about political power. Yes. So That's the only way to affect change. And it's very st strong, soft infrastructure in this entire spectrum. If we are to make sustainable progress, let me not say quick progress, sustainable <laughs> progress about, around this conversation. What do we need to do? What steps do we need to take that can be sustainable? If I should um, quote Chinua Achebe, the problem with Nigeria is leadership. If they say that the food is not sweet, hold the cook. Responsible. If he cooks very well, the entire place will be rent with very beautiful aroma of food that will stimulate your buccal cavity. The point we're making is that if you change the leadership of this country, changing is not in terms of human person. Mm. This leadership style is very, very important. That's what makes one organization fail mm -hmm. in the same market mm -hmm. while the other one is prospering. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the thing we need is change in leadership, leadership style. Those mm. who have knowledge, mm. who have passion, who have patriotism, who want to deliver, who are not caught with the cleavages of religion, ethnicity, and all those primordial idiosyncrasies, mm. they should come on board. And I can tell you within six months, this country will be let loose from the bondage of those who, wants to who want to bastardize it. My question to you in In closing, off in is closing. Different. Okay. Mm -hmm. in dif it's different. Mm -hmm. He talked about leadership, not leader. Mm -hmm. Part of this system is the engine that runs leadership, and that's the civil service. Mm -hmm. Do you see a problem? Oh, huge. In fact, <laughs> the civil service is the engine room of corruption in Nigeria. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, for me... What do we do to make that better? <coughs> whoever takes over as our leader should go and teach value orientation. Everything will From change. ground zero at yes. the civil service. Okay. You know what you taught us civic, civic studies when we in primary mm -hmm. school? I pledge to Nigeria, my country. Let's go back. Mm. We need to teach. So, in other words, for you to remain in the civil service, you must go through value 101, 102... 103, okay. 104. Okay. If we can get the civil service to be one-tenth of the ones where
corruption will drop drastically. So, Lord Jerry, mm. my, my qu closing question to you is also different. How do we avoid a protest of the animal kingdom? <laughs> Where termites, animals, snakes rats and, and monkeys. Snakes and are, are, are you have to disgorge those two things. <laughs> you have to find them first, Mr. Nagy. It is, it, is, it is leadership. It goes back to leadership. Yes. And my favorite example in this country this was uh, Dora Akoyeli. There were people who never knew that that organization existed, existed yeah. yes. before Dora. When it came to that sadhu, when she came there, it wasn't as if she brought some special people to come and populate this no. place. It was the same people. So what changed? The passion, the knowledge. The passion, the knowledge, the leadership. Yes. And that is what we need at every level. It's not just at Abuja, every level of our, of our polity. Wow. Mm. Well, that's a good place to um, leave it. So I can safely assume that the general consensus here is that power should be devolved. True. If possible. Like yesterday. True. <clears throat> it should be devolved. Like yesterday. <laughs> like yesterday. No, if, if possible, because he no, said that there are like some obstacles. Not, whether you like it or not. The, the, yeah. the, 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 we, we are need, primed need. for that. Yeah. Nigerians are tired, sick and tired. They must make a change because the bond and the bondage is for our own eternal ruination. Therefore, we must release ourselves. Thank you very much. Through the ballot process. Okay. The painless killer. Legal <laughs> practitioner, Mr. Chima Naji, Mr. Parables. <laughs> and we also had two social commentators, Mr. Norua Edopolo and Mr. Bolahan Olojedi. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for having your us with us this morning. Sunrise will be back in just a moment. Do stay with us. When was the last time you traveled via an airplane? And how much did you pay, by the way? If it's been a year, well, I don't know. Maybe I should say I understand. Because <laughs> it's no longer funny. <laughs> One and a half flight, now over 100,000 Naira. Depending on where you're going. One hour flight. Mm -hmm. Within Nigeria, over 100,000 naira. That's Lagos, Abuja. To use the word on the street, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the scarcity of aviation fuel isn't making things better, obviously. Uh, add forex to the mix. Oh. And meanwhile, the International Air Transport Association, IATA, uh, as a top global trade association of airlines, has criticized Nigeria's failure to allow international airlines to repatriate their profits, warning it may cause the country more damage. That's as if that was not enough. Anyway, I don't know much about the aviation other than to go into an airplane and fly. And I don't know the next time I'll be able to do that on my own with the... Why are you laughing? <laughs> one million naira to travel abroad? Come on. And that's just probably uh, one way. Actually, it's about four or five million. Economy. And at the end of it, they will put only. Only, yes. <laughs> the experts are here. Yes. Engineer mm. Frank Ogachuku is Tenka Director, Aviation Safety Roundtable Initiative. Thanks for joining Thank us this morning. As well as uh, Tayo Ujuri, who is an aviation expert. Thank you so much for being Good here. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Let me begin with you, um, Engineer Gachuku. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a complex mix. Okay, let me help you. This whole thing started with aviation fuel. Um, what is the position with that now? Any improvement, any resolution in sight for the price to come down a bit at least so that poor man can fly in Nigeria? Alero. Well, that is a valid question. The reason I said I don't know where to begin is the issues are so many. Yeah. So I actually wanted him to tell us which one is the most serious. <laughs> <laughs> they're all serious because they're all resulting in you cannot fly. Are you an expert? You are not an expert in aviation. You are an expert talker. <laughs> <laughs> which is what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so please help us understand first. So because 
so many people who had plans to travel are having to review so many things. As far as the, the, the traveler is concerned, I just want to fly. And the issues are so many. Well, he can't. So what would you say should be the prime issue for us to look at now? Because aviation crisis has led to, uh, you know, international airlines, you know, raising their own issues. Where do we begin? Okay, thank you very much. I, I, think, I think looking at aviation, right, is an issue of safety and security. So all of the elements you're mentioning here now impacts on safety and security. You can't divorce any of them. So we need to deal with the issues holistically, not just taking one out and trying to deal with that. But again, if you do that, the other elements that are not working is going to impact on whatever you've done. So at the end of the day, and that's something we've been doing over the years, piecemeal approach. That's what, so we need to actually holistically look at aviation huh. in Nigeria and deal with issues, whether it's foil issues. I mean, for crying out loud, how come we're not refining jet one in Nigeria? We have for refineries. So the, the point is, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, this issue, of, this issue we're having right with regards to repartition of funds happened. So why would government always wait for crisis, particularly before, you know, because... I, I, my apologies, Engineer Gochuku. I don't like talking about government like it's some mysterious um, institution. Ego. Yes. <laughs> okay. Masquerade. There, are, there are human beings. beings. Mm. Of course. There are agencies who have certain jobs to do. Let's call it what it is. There are, the issues don't have to go as high as the Minister of Aviation. Let's begin at the airports. Let's begin with the travel agents. Let's begin with the regulators of the sector. Let's begin with the person who carries the flag and tells the airlines you know, where to park and all of that. So let's decrypt the issue. So it's not complex. It's not, it's not uh, what's the word now? It's not mysterious to the okay. person who is listening to you and, and you know, seeing you right now. Let's, let's de demystify the whole thing. What are the issues we're dealing with that has become such... I don't know the meaning of the word hegemony right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so let me just start with the issue of foreign repatriation from foreign airlines, yeah? Usually before traffic rights has to be given, there has to be what they call a BASA, bilateral air service agreement between nations. So they agree on how they engage in terms of operating flights between two countries. So they look at, okay, what kind of what frequencies, how many airlines are going to operate, and what kind of stops, how many, how many stops and all of that. It's contained in that document. Also, the issue of fund repatriation actually contained in that document. Article 15, clause 15 of that document stipulates that airlines can repatriate their fund when they demand it. You know, so that's, that's, so Nigeria actually is breaking that agreement by not allowing the airlines actually to send back their funds. Uh, if, you, if you go back in time, like I talked about the other time, 20, 30 years ago it happened, Varic Airlines Brazil went down because they were spending money from their home country to make the, the, the president of Nigeria felt. So it got to say where they said, no, we can't continue with this. So that happened, those airlines actually stopped coming to Nigeria. Okay, so, and I hope it won't happen the same way now, where we are right now. Emirates has, has given the, the signal. So maybe other airlines will also give that same signal and say, look, we're not going to fly until we get our funds. So, let the government honor the agreement. And start from Federal Ministry of Aviation. I mean, that's the Spiracy Ministry for Aviation in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They need to ensure that that agreement is honored. So they, they have a role to play, have a job to do, to show that CBN does what they need. Because CBN is the one who's supposed to actually send by the funds. These funds are domiciled in the Nigerian banks in Naira. Now, what happens is actually, on the day of the sale of a ticket, there's an item official rate which actually in dollar, but converted to Naira, because you cannot, do, you cannot make sales in Nigeria in any other currency except Naira. So on that day of sale of that ticket, there's a dollar value converted to Naira. And that should be the value that, when they're going to repatriate that fund, the day of the sale, that value should be given back to them. But right now, they're spending actually to do at 600, 700. So they're going to Is go. that the cause of the problem? It's part, yes. of, it's part of the problem. So that, that's a, actually a total loss. Because maybe, maybe when they sold that ticket, it was maybe 400 or something naira to a dollar. Yeah. Now you're looking at 700. So the, the airline has actually run at a loss, really. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jury? What's there more to say? <laughs> <laughs> no, the reason I, I, I turn to you because, I mean, if, for him, that's the, one of the core issues to, to look at. Do you have any other issue that you think maybe Nigerians need to know why we're having the kind of crisis that we're having in the aviation sector, such as they can't project, you know, 
you know, their their spending, you know, rates and whatever, whatever, what have you on? I see things. it from a twofold perspective, because they're the Nigerians that want to go for summer, which is actually an, uh, now on the exclusive list, and they're the <laughs> Nigerians that have to operate within domestic operations, either for meetings, business development, uh, marketing, and just develop their sales and of products within Nigeria. So that's where I'm going to actually narrow down and is a focus on, which is the domestic operations and the domestic flights. Yes, fuel is actually 60, 40 to 60 percent of the operations. Fuel is being imported into Nigeria, Jet A1 fuel. And it's actually, as at Thursday, 904 naira yeah. per liter. And by the time you actually convert that, and the number of liters that the minimum liters uptake for the aircraft, you're actually not breaking even. I think the last time we discussed this matter, it had just gone past 400. That's correct. So it is now 900. 904 in Lagos. Yeah. So how many, air, how many airlines can still afford to operate? Exactly. He did mention that where you have to now focus and have a safety and security concern. If you cannot afford to make a, pay your full uptake uh, cost, you are not eligible to, uh, to operate. It's a major concern. So you have to look at that and look at how that trans, uh, transfer, uh, affects your operations and the cost of tickets. Mm -hmm. So let's now pick it back and how to see how that cost of tickets affects the, the, not even the common man, the operating uh, companies in the, in, in, within Nigeria. How many companies will be able to send their staff across Nigeria for meetings, for trainings, for whatever they need to do f uh, at minimum 180 or 200 naira a return leg. But Mr. Juri, government says that there isn't anything that can be done, well, that they can do about it, because that area of the petroleum business has been totally deregulated. Absolutely. Yes, it, it has. And they actually had a three, they had a negotiation of 4.480 Naira per litre for three months. That actually didn't work because the reality on ground is the importers go out there to source, source for their dollar to import it. Central Bank cannot meet and has not been able to meet either the international or domestic airlines uh, uh, forex allocation Demand. request. So, and so, it's not just the it's not just the aviation. Aviation is actually limelight because it's everybody it's for the impact on flights. It's actually across manufacturing. It's across lots of multinationals operating within Nigeria. This is just a time bomb ready to explode. Unfortunately, because it's going to not just affect only airlines. We're going to see airlines affected, and then the international operators. And we're talking about. Uh, manufacturing, all the businesses within Nigeria, FDI's foreign direct investment into Nigeria is going to be affected and the economy will struggle. You know, I, I'm looking at a report released in, um, of an investigation by a media house in Nigeria, released uh, July, just last month, that Nigeria has lost 131 airlines. 52 or thereabout before NCAA came to be, and um, well, some 79 or so since that time. We have lost them to poor management and to accidents. And from what we, you guys, you know, gentlemen are talking about now, it seems like we're yet to, to lose more to situations that they cannot sustain their operations. What, is there a hope anywhere I mean, you have talked about what the CBA needs to do. What would you say, for instance, is the reason why we began to, for want of a better word, going by what you said earlier, dishonor that BASA agreement? What informed it? Is it because we lack the dollars to transfer or what? Well, I mean, obviously, right now, Nigeria is actually a financial crunch. We don't have enough dollars to be able to do what we need to do because we're essentially a consumption nation, really. So what, what are we really exporting? We need to be able to export something to get dollars back in, right? And the major thing we export is crude oil, basically. So 
and you take part of that credit, actually, you're paying for importing fuel and all that. So we don't have enough forex, like you said, to actually spread across the different demands within the Nigerian economy. So that's part of what the issue is, basically. That's first and foremost. Now, another way we could actually solve that problem, actually, is if Nigerian airlines have the capacity, because they don't have capacity right now, actually, to compete with foreign airlines. They don't have what it takes. Fleet capacity, you talk about management, corporate governance is, is a major issue with domestic airlines in Nigeria. They're not resilient in terms of operation. Maybe a few of them are, but they're not really resilient, okay? So corporate governance is a major issue, which has been talked about over and over and over again, that they need to have, have you know, efficient management system that, I mean, you know, part of my challenge actually is that we don't deal with data in terms of taking decisions within, within the efficient environment. It's all about sentiments. There, there's a lot of sentiments about this fuel issue and fund pressure and all that, but you have to have data that you need to analyze to come up with information that anybody actually makes strategic decisions. That's not happening yet. Okay, so again, that's an issue. And I, I'm, I'm happy that the, the regulator is actually dealing with this issue. The NCA is actually dealing with this issue. That's why Dana was actually asked to stop flying. It's an economic issue. So, and that has to do with corporate governance as well. Okay, so a step has started towards that process of trying to ensure that airlines in Nigeria operate within the scope of efficient management system and all that. But if I, if I would, you know, take you up on that, you know, I mean, NCA, I'm, I'm sorry, not to, not casting aspersions, just thinking aloud. NCAA is now taking on one airline after another and all of that to ensure that they do the needful, the false corporate governance based on some research that we may have somewhere. The banking industry was at some point equally vulnerable they were asked to recapitalize. And I think that has happened twice. They have had to recapitalize, mergers and all of that. So it was a function of the regulator of the banking industry to say, do it this way, yeah. so that we don't have a major problem in the economy. Is there something the NCA also could have done to ensure that, to ensure or enforce compliance or compel compliance of corporate governance in the aviation sector. Okay, so interesting, they've actually started that process already. Because they're actually doing audit of all the airlines right now. And anyone who's followed uh, one thing, I mean, they're going to shut them down so, until they're gone. So that's also has already started happening. Then I, I talked about issue of capacity later on. And that's another way to go because you have domestic operations, you have regional operations, you have international operations. So there has to be a certain number of aircraft in your fleet for you to do domestic for you to do regional, and for you to do international. But right now, our airlines do not have that capacity. For example, airlines like Ibom Air, like Airpiece, could be Nigeria flight flag carriers. They need to be empowered to do that, so they can do international flights, and also they earn Forex. Mm -hmm. Now, what will happen actually for them, when they go to maintenance, because everything in the vision is dominated in dollars. So they earn foreign exchange. They can use that to do their C checks for the and all that. So they don't have to now bother get, getting Forex locally from Nigeria, because they already have those fund business tickets they sold. In the international. So that that's, will help to cushion the effect if some of the airlines in Nigeria become flag, flag carriers and operate international flights. So they make the revenue and all that. So that's, that's one way. But it doesn't solve the whole problem, really. But that's one way that you can actually ameliorate the problem you know, a, a, little, a little bit. Mm -hmm. so, that, that's so now, the issue of capacity for me is critical. Look at the West African sub-region. You have Sierra Leone, you have um, Benet, Togo, Ghana, and all that. Mm -hmm. Nigeria needs to exploit that, that environment and use them as a feeder. For example, let's say Epis used to go to South Africa, but they stopped because of visa issues and all of that. Epis could actually make all of those West African countries feeder route to South Africa. So don't just depend on Nigeria. So even if Nigerians are not getting visas, you can, you can actually pick people from, from, from Abidjan, from Dakar, from um, Liberia, and, all, and bring them to, to Nigeria to Johannesburg. Mm. So you're still making your flight. It's for the fact that Nigerians are not getting visa, but you're, you're feeding and you're making foreign exchange mm. in, that, in that respect as well. Mm. Capacity, you say. Capacity, yes. Mr. Jury, mm. it has also been suggested that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure who said it, whether the person is an aviation ministry official who, who suggested that, look, why don't we have aviators also merge? Uh, different, you know, airlines, if you guys are having a crunch here on that side and on this side, why don't you guys just come together and um, two are better than one kind of scenario? What's your take on that? 
Uh, before I go to your question, I'd like to buttress what your question you asked about what the uh, financial sector did. Yeah. We actually have the, what you call the Nigerian Aviation Act that has been, it's going to go live soon. It's going through the process of the National Assembly. Okay. And by the time it goes live, it's, you know, we, as if we have evolved, aviation is dynamic. So we didn't have that opportunity of what the banks had. So okay. with that is going to, I believe, that's going to be an opportunity for us to grow and be able to survive and the realities of the time. Now coming to your question, airlines over time in Nigeria have evolved or started based on different models. Fortunately or unfortunately, airlines in Nigeria have been one, have been personal businesses. So the ownership system actually, actually affects your merger and acquisition process. Because, and it's not, we talked about earlier about corporate governance. That ownership structure affects your corporate governance. And whoever wants to merge based on your model, based on your culture, based on your operations, it's wood, it's a marriage of inconvenience. Well, I, I don't know if this Aviation Act will also answer the question because one of the old banks that comes to my mind, funny enough, is Societe General. Yes. Uh, it went under. Um, Oceanic Bank, so many banks yes. like that, all became property of other, yeah. you know, banks and all of that, irrespective of their ownership structure and all. So if we are looking at the survival and sustenance of the aviation sector if the banks did it how difficult could it be for the aviation sector let's be fair and let's merge apples and apples what about you're not talking about the banks that the uh that amcons have taken over we have a list of those and we have airlines too that amcons have taken over so yes we have that uh, that crop or that bucket of banks that matched and we're forced to match. But others now are independent by taking over by Amcon. So we should not just look at, sometimes what works for the bank does not work for aviation. I'm, I'm, I agree with you, and there are two oh, different sectors. Exactly. I'm just wondering if it is something that can help the process. Yes, and they've actually seen over earlier this year, there was what you call the Spring Alliance that was set up, and it was an initiative by the domestic airline operators by themselves. They saw the need to actually come together strength in numbers. Is it working? They've not, I don't see that. I've not, I've not been able to track that trajectory yet to see what is not, they've not been able to push down the price of fuel. They've not been able to actually push, but maybe on the policy side, they're able to work things out for themselves. We're yet to find that out. Uh, Mr. Kuchuko, uh, you spoke about the sea check a short while ago. Yeah. Um, how difficult is it for airlines to have their sea uh, checks in Nigeria, you are an engineer, so I think that uh, that question is actually going to the right place. We have <laughs> we have a good number of um, uh, what are you guys called now, aviation engineers. So how difficult? We heard talk at one time, I can't remember how long ago it was, about actually making Nigeria a hub, so that sea checks can be carried out in Nigeria. How difficult is it to get that going? Is it the personnel that we lack? Is it the equipment that we lack? What is militating against getting that show on the road? Okay, so it's about what you call the MRO, maintained repair and overhaul facilities, basically. Mm -hmm. um, the state government has been actually um, establishing one. That's not off the ground yet. They're still working on that, right? Okay. The current industry actually also said they're going to establish an MRO. That's, that has not happened yet. Basically, Nigeria can do A and B checks within the country. So with that's Naira denominated. As a, as a matter of fact, aero contractor actually does those checks, aero contractors, right? Okay. Even though they are, they're not flying, but they're still operating their, their maintenance. Maintenance. Yeah, they're still okay. operating that. So they're servicing airlines with that as well. So now the issue, you need to set up a proper functional MRO that has the facilities to undertake a AC check, which you don't have in the country right now. So until we're able to set up that MRO facility, then we can, be, we can be able to now do the C-checks and the all of those How checks. How difficult is it to set it up? Funding. So it depends on, okay, so it depends on investors. Who, who wants to set it up? It's a business, actually. 
a matter of it's a business. It's a business, it's a business yes. Right? So, so you invest in it, you make money, make money out of it. That, you know. Yes. So, but again, the thing is, it comes about the issue of how the industry is being affected now. Because people are looking at, if I invest my money in MROs, how much am I going to get my money back, yeah. my money back? That's a, that's a major issue, right, basically. So people are looking at, foreign investors are looking at all, the, all of those issues and say, look, in as much as Nigeria is a huge market, we can set up this MROs and make our money, the money gets stuck in country and we can't get it back. So at the end of the day, we're actually losing. So where bring the money into Nigeria and invest? So that's part of the challenge. And it's something that is doable. I mean, Ethiopian Airlines is making a lot of money from having the MROs and all that. So it's something that we can do in Nigeria. And we need, and we need to do it because it's going to also reduce the demand for Forex yeah. as well. So now, our problem right now is who is going to put their money down to, stay, to start the business, right? Who's going to invest in it? That's part of the problem, actually. But even though, like I said, the Kwebo State Government is actually building one, but it's been on for quite, 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 quite a long period of time. The federal government have not started that one. They just said they're going to do it, but that's, that has not started as well. Well, we're still waiting for Nigeria Air also. We understand it's supposed to take off in 2023 or before this government is over. Why are you guys laughing? In the face of all, this, with all these challenges? <laughs> that's what the minister said. Come on, I'm not the minister. I'm just <laughs> repeating what the minister said. But Mr. Yuri, let, let me ask you, um, in all of these you know, conversations that we're having, it definitely doesn't seem to be looking very good. Um, the 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 position of Ayata is another one that is not giving us good publicity, if I can use the term. Uh, and it all goes back to what government can do or not. So there is a role for government, there is a role for private sector. What, if you would hazard a guess, could be the middle ground in all of these? Because I'm not sure, I don't know what, the, what kind of, should I say, sanction? that IATA could put on Nigeria with its own intervention now and all of that. So w w what's the implication of the position that IATA is holding in all of this? IATA has actually gone through lots of mediation. We've met with their, I, like, I'll take your words, let's not talk government. There are people in government. They've met with the office of the vice president. They've met, Emirates came and met with the central bank and lead management to actually but have this conversation of how to repatriate their funds. It's not their profit, it's transaction money. And they, they, they did not find a solace. They, were, were, they did not find positivity in it. So they now went back. And now they're making us understand this is going to affect connectivity, it's going to affect confidence, it's going to affect even our position. We always actually have a roadmap on saying we want to make the Nigeria the hub. How would we make the Nigeria the hub of aviation if all this is happening? So this is such an, uh, this is not just one thing. It's not a silo. It's a fact that would affect so many other things and have a domino effect on investor confidence, even on IATA. But what the reality on ground is, is the airlines still in West Africa, this is the market. So what is now happening, the airlines Oh, the, the Turkish, the Virgins, the British Airways, and now you, book, you want to book your ticket to travel. Your exclusive club members that want to travel abroad. You now have to, you, they'll take your reservation, they'll now send a URL to you to go and book your ticket. What that does for you is that you actually have to go and source your dollar at the parallel markets, huh. use your dollar card to pay for that ticket online. So you can buy your ticket from Nigeria. Uh, but but you're paying in dollars. You're paying in dollars. That way they get their dollars remitted immediately, the payments. They mm -hmm. are not tied to the central bank. It goes to their account over there. So that's what they, they found out. That's their way out. Otherwise, alternatively, you have to pay Naira, which is a highly exorbitant. So those are the options at the moment. And they, I don't see lots of airlines shutting down. You know, there's been lots of what we call aeropolitics. Yeah. We've had over, that over with um, Emirates. So it's just like there are lots of matters, and this is just, they cannot take this again. We, we have had issues over them, with them. The, even before they stop, they stop issuing to, uh, visas to Nigerians on the 30. So they put everything in the box and find out their decision. I don't know what made up that decision, but other airlines will not just pack and go. There are those that would find out these are the other things. And lastly, 
you actually there's always op opportunities you have that street language when one door opens another uh, when one window opens another door closes we go back to Bene. The, that's been when the, if there was closure with was COVID. People went across the border. You see traffic opening up in Bene. Ghana is uh, str struggling with inflation. Maybe we'll help them with the number of travelers going to Nigeria and going through to Ghana now. We help them get out of inflation better, faster rather, because now they are able to get their money out of Accra or Ghana. Yes, and so we, we'll go to Ghana and fly out of West Africa. Mr. Jury. If yes, they're sending you a URL to use your dollar card to pay for, for your ticket, um, can you just intimate us of approximately how much it would cost, for instance, for one to fly economy from here to London? It would. Um, it would well, you know, it's a function of your day ec economy, and it could be, uh, I would I'll presume. Not a promo ticket, no. Not a promo ticket, I yeah. presume, and I'm just making my perception analysis of mm. you i want a premium economy for you and you you want a month it would d differ but it would you're looking about a thousand two thousand and i can't you can't nail that to it depends on the time of the year it depends so many the proximity of your date of travel yeah. so all those things affect the Please, algorithms. can you say it in naira that's the one we understand <laughs> if you go to naira <laughs> and you would actually see about six thousand dollars seven thousand dollars and if you actually multiply that at, at the uh, uh parallel market real it's something that will buy land in my village <laughs> Or build a house. Yeah. Buy a land of Lagos as well. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of scary. So those who have um, traveling on their list of things to do for this year had better be looking at other things. They, mean, they should just review it. <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell them to... No, no, look at other things now. Review it. No, I'm sorry. Right. Where the review is going to go, that's... Okay. That's, but there yeah, are different that's reasons that's... for traveling, though. Exactly. There are different... There's the... Even right, the business part... Mm. Yeah. It's the, the, the fam, visiting family and friends. Yeah. There's the healthcare yeah. part of it, and there's the education part of it. Yes. And then, lastly, we've seen the demography of those that are like leaving the country. So, whatever the ticket price, they would buy because they have to want to leave. So, Engineer Gachuku, this is where we are. Last words mm. now. Four hundred and sixty-four million dollars is not small money. One of the areas which, and I, you, you, I think you spitted this earlier, is we're a largely consuming nation. nation. Sadly. How significantly will this whole thing affect cargo business, cargo traffic into Nigeria? And how will that affect the prices of whatever? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so they actually on the same, on the same um, platform to speak because the cargo airlines also are bringing stuff into Nigeria. They get paid in Naira. They need to also move their funds back yeah. in USD as well. So it affects both the mm. commercial airlines. And, and if they refuse to come to Nigeria because of all these? So that's, that's where the challenge is right now because... The Nigerians will start. We've not gotten there yet. Okay, so both the, the commercial airlines and the cargo airlines, right? So if they stop coming to Nigeria, how can we... I mean, we're going to be kind of cut off from the global community, basically, because of this dishonor. In other words, you agree with how Nigerians will starve. That's what you're saying. We're not essentially. Maybe it will not force us actually to look inward. Maybe that's the strategy. <laughs> yeah. But there's so much, so much to talk about here, gentlemen, because oh, I mean, it's, it's too much. I mean, come on, $464 million. All stock. Can't imagine one million. One million? Hey, Five hundred thousand yeah. dollars. <laughs> <money. laughs> <laughs> and there, Frank Hongachuku, thank God, Director, Aviation Safety Roundtable Initiative. Thank you so much thank for you. your time this morning, as well as Mr. Tayo Ujuri, an aviation expert. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. That moment. More to come after now. This one, whether you are home or abroad, it concerns you. Have you had a situation where someone gets into the room and the first thing you do is close your nose? That and a number of other things when we return from this break. Stay with us.
Well, thank you for staying with us. You know, that which I spoke of before we went on that break is coming after this one. This one, this time around. Let's have some fun. Why are you laughing? Anyway, um, you saw in that slide, we're talking about the 6th Nigeria International Film and TV Festival. What does all that mean? We want to have a conversation uh, with Ijoma Ona, who is founder of Nigerian International Film and TV Summit. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We're making a lot of money from film and TV, right? Absolutely. Mm. Can we borrow Nigeria? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, interesting. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, maybe we'll, we'll talk about you know the whole you know festival summit thing. But what are the things that you think maybe people don't even understand about it? Because we hear uh, film industry is growing very very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Uh, almost, if not the fastest growing in the world and mm -hmm. all of that. Um, there must be a lot of work that has gone into that. Absolutely. Okay, so like you rightly asked, there's a lot, right, that happens, especially behind the scenes, that people don't know about. And um, that is one of the things that we actually try to highlight with the summit. Mm. Now, when you come to the, the business of film, right, um, there are like four four basic elements of film business and um, there's always been a lot of focus on production so when you tell somebody that you are in film the first thing they ask is what film what movie have you made right naturally, <laughs> naturally. Yeah. you so, have to have proof exactly. well, well 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 to them so yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> however there are other aspects of the ecosystem that people are not aware of there is film finance Okay, which means um, people who are in that space, all they do is to raise money for film. That's their job. Okay. Yeah. And then there's also film distribution. These are the guys who are going f from one market to another market, you know. So distribution and marketing are, are together? Well, um, they complement each other. But okay. they're actually different. Okay. So distribution is when you talk about licensing, you know, the rights, everything you see on television, right? Mm. Every program that you see foreign, or different genres, movies, Hollywood, Bollywood. There is a process that happens mm. from the point where, you know, the acquisitions manager sees it and says, oh, I want this program for my channel. There's a lot that happens that people are not aware of. There is a lot in terms of there is a legal process, there is negotiation, there are commercial terms that must be agreed on. When you talk about commercial terms, you talk about the licensing period, how long is it going to be on this channel, there is also the territory, is it Nigeria, is it Africa, is it global rights? Then of, of course there is also the, exclu the exclusivity and non-exclusivity rights, okay? And then what platform? Is it free to air, right? Is it paid? TV? Is it VOD? Is it SVOD? Mm -hmm. is it what's, what's VOD? <laughs> what's the video on demand? <laughs> yes, VOD is video uh -huh. on demand. Yes. Don't be using jargon. Uh, please. <laughs> so there is subscription video on demand rights, there is advertising video on demand rights, there is transactional video on demand rights. That sounds so, like, a, like a lot of work. Oh, yes. It, but, trust me, it is. You, you, I, re, I recall... So, so, sorry, sorry. You, you, spoke, you said there are four of them. You've mentioned three. Yeah, I've mentioned distribution, finance, production, of course. Okay. Right? Okay. Marketing. Okay. Who are the people that take them to the cinemas? Um, so, cinemas are distributors. So, okay. you have distribution companies hmm. who are in the charitable space. Then also on television... On the TV side, you also, and I mean, this is where I have done most of my career on the TV side for distribution. I'm not a producer, but I've worked a lot with producers to help them make money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember in those days, mm -hmm. the late 80s and early 90s, yeah. in the days of uh, movies like Domitilla, okay. where we heard that it was the marketers who smiled all the way to the bank, but the actors didn't get anything, well, didn't get much out of it the directors, the producers. I mean, first of all, is that true? And two, is that still the case now? Oh, no. We've moved away from that a long time ago. So, you know, in those days of um, 
v uh, VCD, is it? Yeah, mm. CDs and yeah, mm. video, um, video VCD, CDs. yes. Uh, so what happened was that the marketers essentially were the ones who invested. They were the, they are like the financiers. Okay. So there was always, within this ecosystem, right, you can see somebody who decides to wear all the hats. So he finances the movie, mm -hmm. he produces the movie, he's the executive producer, and then of course he also goes to do the marketing and, you know. So essentially the, the, the actors, the talents are more like paid to deliver and that's it. That hasn't so much changed, it's just that there's been a lot of refining, okay, of the process for that, where you now have distribution companies Okay, we have structured companies who are distributors, mm -hmm. and all they do is when a producer goes on location, they finish their production, they come to the distribution company. So some producers decide to self-distribute. Mm -hmm. So what it means is they are the ones who are going to different channels to say, buy my movie, or they are the ones traveling to different markets to pitch their movies to international you know, buyers and distributors mm -hmm. as well. But there are very few people who can do that because it's capital intensive. So this is film 101 that you've given us. This yeah, week. absolutely. <laughs> now, so now tell us about this uh, international film summit. summit. Okay. Is this a summit or festival? It's a summit. It's a summit. Yeah, okay. we are all very, very business centric. It's all because you know I think this. You, been, why wouldn't you be? It's show business, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm. Well, well, well. So the showbiz side is. You know, what you see on the outside, you see people, you know, on the red carpet and all that. No, that's actually not what this is about. Oh, yes. really? Yes, that's what you see. Like in the first two parts, there's a lot of parties. There are people who are doing all sorts of things. It's fun. Uh. But this is much more very, very serious. Yes, because we are talking about investments. We're talking about return on investments. We're talking about what are the different windows that needs to be exploited. You know, what is the pathway? When you get a film, how do you do you deal do you treat your film as a product okay you know the whole there's a whole ecosystem that is involved and so when we started we started six years ago in the u.s um at the american film market which is like the film headquarters this is where every year distributors independents come together uh, either to look for financiers to look for distribution companies so a whole a hotel of um, about 200 rooms is shut down they move all their offices to that place for one to 10 days and it's all business you know buying and selling of rights for movies so um, and that's where we started six years ago in, in, in Los Angeles and after that I, I said listen we also have to develop our own industry charity must begin from home right and that is why we came back I came back in Nigeria and in 2018 we started the Lagos edition and uh, essentially what we try to do is to help people to understand to build capacity for the industry because it's not about ca carrying cameras I see producers who, you know, I ask them, why do you want to produce a movie? For some, it's just to have their name at the end credits. So you get money from somebody, from an investor, and then you can't even figure out how you're going to make the money back. We need to build sustainable businesses. And if we're going to build sustainable businesses, it's very important that the key players in this industry are equipped with the right knowledge. Mm. Right. It's very important that people know that there is a journey. It's not just enough to get money, get somebody to give you money, get your father, your mother, your uncle to give you money. You take their money, and then at the end of the day, when you make the, the bogus problem, promises to them to say, oh, this movie is going to gross X, Y, Z amount, 100 million, 200 million. And you have no plan. You have no plan. There is no strategy mm -hmm. around how you're going to get from point A to point B. So it's How not... that 100 million is going exactly, to come in, essentially. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So this festival, essentially, Summit. Was, okay, so, <laughs> Summit, is to talk about the four items that you spoke about. Absolutely. All that is available, all the avenues through which one can invest make and make money in the film and television business. Absolutely. That's what this that uh, is, a summit is all about. Yes, that's what it is. We look at packaging. How do you package your movie? If you're going, for example, we're going to have a session, a pitch session, where producers will have opportunity to pitch to streaming companies, their projects. So do you understand how you can convince somebody to put money into your project? Mm. That is very important, mm. right? Because at the end of the day, we are trying to drive investments into the industry. Okay. Right? Now, there are those who have uh, said that all of the issues you talked about, all of the problems of mm -hmm. the industry, mm -hmm. is because the industry doesn't have 
structures. It's not, it's not set up as a business per se. Absolutely. So is there any way in which the summit addresses that? Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. So, you know, the, the, the issue of structure is very critical, right? And, you know, when you talk about structure, it's you understanding that, listen, you're a producer. Stay in your production. When you are done with your finished product, if from your point of pre-production, you get a distributor who will give you the commercial elements that need to get into that movie so it can be commercially viable. So that is production and distribution, how they interface. So you don't have, you know, I see producers say, oh, this story is beautiful. Oh, it's, who are you making it for? Who is your audience, right? So you need to understand all that, sit down with a distribution, a distributor, have a distributor give you input to say this genre is not going to work, that genre is, go is going to work, okay? And let's move away from passion because there's a lot of things that people do based on passion that doesn't translate to money. <laughs> At the end of the day, they you could know, be doing it just for the passion, my dear, not for the money. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but talking about talking about structure and yes. all of that, yes. um, you know, in all of it people talk about industry. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the film industry in Nigeria, one is looking at, one is trying to um, compare with established, other established, yeah. you know, you know yep. like yep. the yep. Hollywoods and the rest of them, mm -hmm. where they rate movies. You've talked about categorization of the movies now, but then there is the issue of ratings. It would seem like we don't seem to have that because almost all our you know, movies, uh, dramas that have a little bit of action, a little bit of comedy, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The only horror film I remember in Nigeria was uh, Jimmy Odumosu's Evil Encounter that I remember. Okay. Well, maybe there have been others. I think Living in Bondage was also supposed to be a horror movie, but with the little spices of comedy here and there, I'm not sure. So in terms of rating movies into A movies, B movies, and the rest of them, is this summit also in any way addressing that okay so now that you're really delving into you know i'm sorry we are, <laughs> see, <laughs> see, <laughs> we are, we are curious to find out because yeah. we, people always benchmark the nigerian industry or nigerian films mm -hmm. with foreign films and there is no 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 walls anymore so now it's so you know let's make a separation okay when you're talking about movies you're talking about content generally. Remember that there is television and mm -hmm. there is also cinema. I mean, they complement each other, but in real sense, in the, in, in the, in the, in the real um, business, they're actually a bit different. So when you talk about ratings, for example, for movies, okay, before you go to, you release your movie in the, in the cinema, right? So normally there are windows that must be respected. So when you make a feature film, traditionally, traditional distribution entails that you go to the cinema first and then you exploit that theoretical window. So wait, before you get into the cinema, of course, there is the censorship that must happen. You must go to the National Film and Video Censors Board. They are the ones that will watch you film the movie and then, of course, do the ratings that you talk about. Mm -hmm. to say, oh, so all that is actually very much in place. And the, uh, and the National Film and Video Censors, they've been doing fantastic in, in that regard to make sure mm -hmm. that the right content goes into the cinemas, right, and then also for the right audiences that should watch those movies mm -hmm. so on the cinema side definitely that is you know very much taken care of then when you move to television also because television the genres are not the same is you can't go to a cinema and watch a reality show for example it's not possible <laughs> right you can't go to a cinema and watch a cooking show right so you can see that at that point the people who are playing in the tv space they become a, a very clear separation the producer who is making movie for cinema and the producer who is making content for television, they are not in the same business. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. So we'll make that separation to ensure that those, I mean, they all, they all come out to answer their producers, but their business models are not the same. Mm -hmm. So for television, you, you either, you, you know, license, you, you, you get licensing fees, for for certain period of time, or you uh, you monetize like in Nigeria is hugely monetization via advertising. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of inter independent mm -hmm. producers; they produce, they buy airtime, they put in there, and then they go look for advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, ultimately, um, you are bringing them all together under this 
uh, summit, even yes. though they, they use the same equipment, right? Of course. Uh, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> so uh, bringing them all to the same table, and uh, what are some of the major highlights of this, um, of this summit? Okay, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, every year we have a particular country that we try, that is very interested in Nigeria. And we have a country of honor focus. So we've done that previously. We've had Cote d'Ivoire, we've had Kenya. And then um, this year we're having the United Kingdom as our country of honor. So what that means is we are partnering with the British Film Institute. They are they are sending a delegation of film professionals from the United Kingdom to come and explore opportunities with Nigeria. We need to start making cross-cultural stories. We need to make local stories, original stories that can have, have global appeal, right? Mm. And you know that Nigeria, of course, and the United Kingdom have a history. and There's a huge diaspora, right? We need to make that connection between the local industry. A lot of them, the producers in the UK, the Nigerian producers, they're trying to find their way into our industry, but it hasn't been so easy. So we're hoping that this summit will give them the opportunity to connect, to make that connection, right? Yeah. I'm, yeah. Assuming, I'm assuming that you are going to get them to shoot a James Bond movie in Nigeria. Don't answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, 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 only last week I heard about some collaboration between Nollywood and Bollywood. Absolutely. And some Nigerian actors who have got roles in some mm -hmm. Bollywood movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that what you're talking about, about this cross-culture? Absolutely. So actually, this project you're talking about, we're going to have a dedicated session that is going to be chaired by the Indian High Commissioner in Nigeria. So it's a big thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a big thing we're trying to do, you know, working with the producer to say, listen, we can actually begin to cross over you know, to cross over to other territories. So we've got one hour and, and the them end, cross over to us as well. Yeah, no, no, definitely, <laughs> definitely. You know, so we have it at the the the, the Bollywood uh, Nollywood crossover. We have a session on this project to talk about the opportunities that this has, the potentials that this has. Of course, the producer have done something before uh, Namse Wahala, which was also very successful. And now um, they, they are, they are trying to take a cast of, uh, of about five top Nigerian actors to India. And um, so we're working with her on that to spotlight what she's doing and then um, also have the, the, the high commissioner, in, in the Indian high commissioner being part of this. That's one of the highlights of, our, of, of the program. And at the end, we're going to have some networking events just to help people to meet each other and connect with each other. Okay. Okay. What, what's the, okay, go ahead. So, when is the summit? Where is it? And who is going to attend the summit? Okay. So, the summit is starting uh, from the 29th of August, uh, 30th, 31st, and the 1st of September. So, 29th, we have an opening at the Radisson. We're using the Radisson Blue and the Radisson Hotel sitting next to each other at the KJ GRA. Okay. So we have a full day on the 30th where dedicated to film business because we need to make that separation between film and television. It's not the same, right? So there's a day for film, cinema releases and all that. And then the second day we look at television. <laughs> Right? We look at television business, we look at what is that. So our team this year is streaming wars. What is the implication for content monetization for both film and television? There's disruption happening. And television needs to, you know, we need to come up with the reality of what is happening. Okay, yeah. we know that uh, TV is free, you pay to watch films, but is the summit free? Well, no. <laughs> yes and no. So we've got industry access badge that gives you access to, to, to just the conference sessions. And then we have the executive gold badge, which will give you access to some invite-only sessions. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's not paid, per se? No, it's paid. Oh, so okay. the, the, the one that gives you access to exclusive events, invite-only events, networking, receptions, and closed-door events, you have to pay for it. But if you just want to come and sit down and have listen to the conversation, but well, it's subject to eligibility, actually. Mm. So okay. we still have to look at your profile, what you've done, if we're going to ask, give you that free access. So that's your website, right? Yeah, absolutely. For those who may not be close enough or may not be able to see the small types, what's the website? So, uh, NIF Summit, nifsummit.com, www.nifsummit.com. Okay, I see, I see war in that. Oh, yes. so, <laughs> war, but I also see monetization. Uh, yes. It's the kind of war that I want to go to. Yeah, yeah that's So, um, 
brief highlights of the event again. Um, so starts on the 29th. Yes, and then 30th for film, um, 31st for television, and then on the 1st, we're doing screenings. Okay. Yes, we do what we call buyer screenings. So, you know, giving producers opportunities to come screen, and then, you know, broadcasters, streaming companies can actually come sit down, watch. I mean, we're not inventing anything here. This is what you see in those climbs that you think are structured. Mm. So we need to also build our industry. So there is for directors, producers? No, it's basically for producers because basically this is all producers. business. The producer is the one who runs the business. Okay. Yeah. And, then and writers as well. Okay. Yes, yeah, distributors, okay. uh, uh, cinema owners. So we work very closely with you know all the major cinemas in Nigeria. They are always supporting what we are doing. I, I actually want to say thank you to all the guys who are supporting us because this is a platform that allows them to address issues in their businesses. TV stations? TV stations, yeah. of course. Who come definitely. shopping for programs? Yes, yes. Essentially the programs. people who we don't see on, in the films and the TV shows. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Founder, Nigerian International Film and TV Summit. Thank you so much Thank for your time you. this morning. Thank you so much. Best. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. All right. So we're going to that conversation that I talked about the other time. Alera is laughing again. Oh, dear. When we return from this break. Mm. <laughs> I'm Thank you for staying with us. Well, we're talking about dental hygiene, and right now, um, without seeing a drill, um, I can actually <laughs> hear a drill going, and I'm actually developing goosebumps. Shows you how afraid <laughs> some people are of the dentist's chair, which means that if you don't want to sit in a dentist's chair, you have to take care of your teeth. So. How do you take care of your teeth? And is there any connection between dental health and your overall health? Dr. Abimbola Udushote is here to tell us all about that. She's a dental surgeon and general secretary of the Association of Private Dental Practitioners of Nigeria. And she's a certified nutrition coach. They go hand in hand. Good morning, Dr. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. I'm sure you didn't pity me when I was uh, <laughs> talking about the drill and everything. So, well, if you don't take care of your teeth and you have to end up in the chair, it's entirely your fault. And then uh, you're going to hear the drill. Well, and feel it. <laughs> well um, I think that unfortunately in Nigeria, we, a lot of people are just not aware enough because with dental health, oral care, Anything that does with most of the things that are that will make you go through the drill is actually preventable So when you're aware from childhood on how to take care of your teeth yeah. Then you have no reasons to actually go under the drill You have no reason for us to give you injections in the mouth, which is another thing people are scared of to remove your tooth Ooh, I love that bitter taste of the injection. When the injection, just one drop gets in yes. your mouth. Excuse me, who are you? <laughs> mm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it's true. It's bitter, but it's yes, a it's nice bitter. kind of bitter. Really? Yes. <laughs> so a lot of people don't like the bitter taste. Well, are you an alien? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> who likes bitter? That's very strange. Um, you said when we are aware from when we are very young yes unfortunately a, a lot of young children are not taught early enough yes about cleaning their teeth morning and night yes. night especially so that they do not end up in the dentist's chair yes from your experience is that awareness getting better now well I, I think a lot of, um, there's a lot of education going on, but in reality, I think a lot of younger children now, they know brush your teeth twice a day, but we don't, we are not seeing that in terms of people coming into their clinic. We always encourage that you bring your child, as soon as they have teeth, they should have their first encounter with the dentist. Now, one of why, yes, why at that age, they have no fear of the dentist. Mm? 
They have no fear of the dentist yet. They have no fear of anything. Yes. No, my so, little boy doesn't like an injection. Any, no, no, we're not giving them. What, what you're bringing them to do is to be aware that they need to take care of their teeth. They should, I mean, they come in, we're not giving any injections. We're probably not doing anything. They probably, they don't have anything anyway. But just to know that they, they, there's a place called this dental chair, have a familiarity with it. A lot of times when people come into the dentist, they are already in pain. So their first visit is associated it's with pain. Painful. Yes. yes. So but if people come in and yeah, we're having more children come in for school visits and we're doing more of school visits as well, going to school and introducing the dentist to them, the dental hygienist to them. But we also want them to come in and see that we're not so bad. The chair is for a lot of people, for young ones, it's for a fun thing to sit on. Especially mm. those who like bitter injections. <laughs> <laughs> let, no, me, no. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you, man. Yes. Um, well, it's, we're talking about lifestyle around dental yes. hygiene. And, you know, one of the things that I said earlier is that, you know, people come into uh, a room and other people tend to just... <laughs> <laughs> Close their noses. Okay. Hello. Now, in such a case, what you're talking about is um, what we call halitosis. Also known as mouth odor. Yes, also known as <laughs> mouth odor. That yes. Now, that can, there are several factors that causes that. When you have accumulation of um, plaque, if you don't brush well, now brushing is something that is taught. It's not something. If I don't know how to brush well, I can't teach my children how to brush well or brush properly. There's nothing wrong in using chewing stick, but you must use the chewing stick to clean your teeth. But a lot of people just and chew on it. That is not cleaning your teeth. So if you don't clean your teeth well, you will have accumulation. Even if you clean your teeth well, there are parts of our teeth that, that still accumulate what we call calculus or tata. This can only be removed by a dentist or a dental hygienist, what we call scaling and polishing. And if you've experienced that, you see they bring out some hard things yeah. from your teeth. Mm. Now, when that accumulates there, it can cause a mouth odor. Another thing that can cause a mouth odor is if you have a hole in your teeth. Food gets in there, you're not bringing it, it gets rotten, of course, it will bring mm. a mouth odor. Another thing, which is quite common, in our setting is fasting yes oh. fasting we call it the fasting breath or morning breath a lot of people have a bad odor when they wake up first in the morning before cleaning <laughs> if you've not drank water you have a dry mouth that can bring a odor more complicated things can also be gut infection lung infection when you have a cold when you have any kind of infection or, or illness around the truth can also bring a mouth odor. Hmm. So but the, you, you talked about washing you know, the teeth the other time. Yes. How about the tongue? There are those who also say that if you, don't wa if you wash your teeth and not wash your tongue, that could also cause... Well, the tongue naturally is self-cleansing. Even though, yes, the back of the tongue, if they are accum for some reason, some, some people accumulate things at the back of their tongue. And then when you brush it, and that definitely will help clean. But naturally, the mouth, the tongue is self-cleansing. Okay. But when things accumulate at the back, maybe you eat some things. Now, there's some kind of food that you eat that stick to the teeth. Unfortunately, in our own environment, we eat a lot of carb heavy, the soft agege bread that we like, um, plantain, fried plantain, rice. They stick to the teeth. Bacteria works on it. Should we not eat them? Again? You eat them and you brush. You don't, we don't even encourage brushing immediately after eating anymore. We encourage you eat all your food at the same time. Even the children that like the sweet, the, 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 the sweet things. As much as we don't want you to eat the sweet things, but if you must eat them, eat them with your meal. It's not this idea of with oh, you're sipping Coke all the time or sipping a drink all the time. Ah. And you're bathing your teeth in sugar. We don't want that. We want you that if you want the soda or the, the, the sweet things, eat it with your meal. And after eating your meal, in the morning after brushing, at night before you go to bed, brush your teeth. 
and make sure there's nothing accumulating there. Uh, how about, well, I'm sure you are wondering why you should have everything together. We'll come to you who <laughs> enjoys bitter taste. Mm. Um, there are those who have this almost like they can't stop the saliva from flowing in their mouth. We all have saliva that flows yes, in our but mouth. but this one is like... The and they're always spitting? Yes, something like that. There are, in such cases, there are times when such happens. We see, we see that in pregnant women, in some pregnant women. Mm -hmm. Men don't get pregnant in Nigeria, yes. to the best of my knowledge. Yes, in, in, in that's the world. I said, in Thank some you. pregnant women. Even mm. not all pregnant women spit. Um, some people, it is when they are irritated by something. Some people are easily irritated, so once that... I mean, I, I tell patients when they come in, especially when you've, done, you've removed a tooth, and you tell them there's no blood in your mouth, swallow your saliva. And they keep saying, I can't swallow my saliva. Tell them, you swallow your saliva all, all the, the time. time. <laughs> but now something has been done in your mouth. Somebody has put their hands in your mouth. And suddenly you feel irritated, and you're thinking you need to be spitting out. But we swallow our saliva all the time. But some people just get easily irritated, and then they just want to keep spitting out. What are some of those... Um um, lifestyle vulnerabilities that make us susceptible to all of this, some of these conditions? Well, definitely our diet. Oh God, not again. Yes, whether we like it or not. Our diet has a lot to do with a lot of things as a consensus. Such as? Um, like yeah. I said, a, a diet full of sweets, um, processed carbohydrates. Is definitely not good for the teeth. Why? Because in our mouth, naturally, we have bacteria. When a baby is born, there is no bacteria. But within a week or two, the baby has the same bacteria in its mouth that the mother has. You know, but we don't clean babies' mouths. We don't, but they have the kind of bacteria the mother has. But their mouths don't smell. They don't smell because they don't. They, they drink milk. So they have no reason, it has no reason to smell. Mm. It has no mm. reason to let, smell. Let me, let me ask you something. Uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to you. Yes. You know, you are a grandmother. Mm. And sometimes, you know, there are some issues. I'm just wondering um, how grandmothers have to cater for, uh, for the little ones. When, you know, I'm sure that some mothers are even just generally afraid to take their child to any hospital at the time. So I'm wondering what Dr. Rishote is saying here, that I have to bring the, doc, the, the little baby in for some visit to someone who will be Familiarization him. tour. No, there's no family in the house. <laughs> <laughs> The baby is not so little anymore by the time they have their first teeth. Yeah. Which comes on average by the time they're seven to nine months. So they're not so little anymore. But that's still... Yeah. Okay. So what, what do you do to them when they come at nine months? We just look at their teeth. We, we give them the mirror to hold and we put them on a chair. And we just look at that and see how their teeth and, and, and educate their moms on how to care for that teeth. Because a lot of times they are growing these new teeth. Their mothers don't know how to clean them. They are like, oh, should I just put my finger? So we teach them how to take care of the teeth. Yes. How does a mother clean a baby's teeth? Well, one of, one of the things that we, we encourage, you can put the cotton wool or if a clean face towel and just use that to clean and clean the tongue, wipe the teeth. Okay. So you can do that with using your finger. There, there's actually some covers, finger brushes that you can use for babies. Mm -hmm. And there are also there are toothbrushes because, of course, at that time is the time to introduce them to using the toothbrush. You really don't need toothpaste. At that age, you really don't need to face toothbrushing. Toothbrush and then once they come in, we also put um, fluoride washes on the teeth at that time. That's the first time because we, we know that fluoride helps um, form stronger teeth, mm -hmm. which makes it more immune to holes, having holes. The teeth become stronger when there's fluoride. There, there was something that we used when we were young mothers. I think it was glycerin or borax or something. Okay. Yeah, at Am that I time, correct? yes, glycerin. Like yes, glycerin. Yes, glycerin. Well, there's no harm in using that. It, it has nothing, but there's no advantage either. Okay, interesting. You can just use a, a, brush. Oh, a brush. You don't have to yes, use any toothpaste with yes. it. There, there was something you spoke about before we came on air. Yes. And you guys were talking about the both of you were talking about some 
cosmetics that people yes. put on the teeth. Yes. Turkey teeth. P please you tell me about that. I saw that only this morning. Because, you know, I've also seen a trend. You talk about that one, please, mm -hmm. as well. But I've also seen a trend. Some people just want to put braces on their teeth, for sure. Well, it is really not for sure. <laughs> I don't think an orthodontist, who is, who, um, an orthodontist is a specialist that puts on the braces. And, uh, the, this is why I said that. Yes. Someone sees other people wearing it and just says, it looks nice. I like to wear one. Well... I don't, that, I, that's why I said I don't see orthodontists just putting, putting on it there for, for, for fun. The thing there is, there is something that that person is not happy about. Okay. You, especially when you, in, in Nigeria, unfortunately, we see a lot of adults putting on braces. Well, that's when they can afford it. There's something they were not happy about in their mouth. And over the years... What we used to call shamuga. It could be shamuga. It could, <laughs> even diastema. It is a thing of beauty here, but dentally, it is an aberration, and it should be closed. Yes, define the aesthetic. The space, the gap between the teeth. Tooth gap. Yes. We see it as it's AG. You yes. just call it tooth gap. <laughs> oh, <laughs> can braces correct that? Yes, it can. Ah. It can. When people have crooked teeth, they have one, teeth in, one tooth in front of the other. There are people that maybe they, are not, they cannot smile. Or maybe somebody had made fun of them and they cannot smile. Oh. So when they have the opportunity, they want to correct it. Coming to talk it, it or what, what people have been going, well, not from, I don't think people have been going from Nigeria. Yet. But what we yet, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what people have been going there to do, to reduce cost, we, they want to wear things, what we call veneers and crown, so that they can have a beautiful smile. Now, what a veneer will do, it will cover the front of your teeth. So all of it will be even, white, the color you want, okay. and so you have a beautiful smile. Unfortunately, it, I, I think the article, which I had read as well, is, was talking about how people were not aware that instead of veneers, they were doing crowns for them. Because in a crown, you actually shave down the tooth. Yes. So now they have no choice. Unlike a veneer where you just do a, a kind of... Um, covering. covering in front mm. of the teeth. So that is what people are doing. People want beautiful smile. That's what things like whitening we're seeing now. Even now in Nigeria, one of the things we're fighting as dentists is the fact that a lot of people go to spas. There are lots of spas advertising whitening. And they're not telling people the implication. Because Can that really happen? That your teeth are whitened? Yes. Your teeth can be whitened. Using what? There are, what, there, there are um, chemicals that are used, including hydrogen peroxide. Ooh. But there's, a, there's also there's a pro and there's a con. Hmm. Whitening can increase sensitivity, which is another problem entirely. Hmm. If, if, what are the, just for, we have just about five minutes. Okay. What are some of the conditions that can be linked to oral health? Wow, one that is very common. Um, I'm going to talk about two. Heart health. I mean, Heart. cardiac, yeah. Oh. Oh. There are some bacteria in the mouth that when we see it is an indication of a heart problem oh. that, can, that, can, that is linked with heart problem. Um, when you have some kind of um, like valvular heart disease, it is very, it is one of the things that when you come into the dentist, you need to tell your dentist because even something as simple as cleaning your teeth can be life threatening. Wow. Um, diabetes, a lot of people have been diagnosed in the dental clinic because your oral, um, the gum health is shown when people are diabetic, their gum health is um, one of the indications of that. And when it's been linked, if you don't have a good gum health, it has been linked with diabetes so, and heart disease. So those are the two things, very key. What can we then do? Let's talk about some to-dos for people now. Okay. You know, what can people do to improve their dental or oral hygiene? Well, first and foremost, I think if you've never, I've, I've seen Nigerians that they're in their 50s, 60s, and say, I've never been to a dentist. Mm -hmm. Please go to your dentist. Let them even examine you. Let them know, is there a problem? Once you know that there is a problem, oh, are you brushing right? I mean, get it correct. So that, okay, if I have a problem, 
if I have a feeling, I remember even as a child for me, I, I visited the dentist a lot. But my first experiences with the dentist was to have my teeth extracted. But over the years, by the time I got into the university and I went to see a dentist, and I had to do some fillings. He did those fillings, and those are the since then I've not had to do any more fillings. I've not had to, I've not had to remove any tooth, because he did those fillings at that time, and we're talking of over 30 years ago. So first, going to your dentist. What if I have a problem? Let me solve the problem first. I know that a lot of times people think about the cost, but at least pre preventive. That okay, let me go. Let me know what the problem is. Well, I know that we do a lot of programs where they are free universities, they are free programs, and say, oh, come for dental examination. Know what, your, know what the problem is. If you have a problem, you might not have a problem. Mm -hmm. You might not have a problem. Know if there's a problem. Know the solution. Learn how to the techniques, the brushing techniques that yes. will work for you. Yes. Because what might work for um, Mr. A, because of the shape of his teeth, might not work for Mrs. B. Mm. How about... Um um, nutrition. Uh, you, well, thankfully, you're also a nutrition coach. So, yes. how do both work together? How do people improve their dental health or oral health so, through nutrition? Okay, that is a very good question. Now, processed carbs is not a good thing for your oral health. But when you do eat it, when you do eat the bread, the why don't you hand it up with chewing a carrot, for example? You know, the funny thing is do chewing... Do go together? No, it, do, it doesn't matter about it going together. Okay. Why are you chewing the carrot? You're chewing the carrot so that... Because carrot or fruit, they naturally clean the teeth. Okay. So when you chew... Chewing actually cleans the teeth. So if you chew okay. only with your right side, your left side will be very dirty. When you come in, we can, we can always tell where you're chewing with because one side is cleaner than the other. So chewing things like carrots... Oh, you finish eating, you finish drinking the soda, swish your mouth with water. So that, okay. why? Because you will want saliva to flow and bring the pH of the mouth back to... Now, carb, processed carbs, sodas, they, they are acidic. And when there's acid and bacteria, that's when it softens the teeth. The, teeth, the enamel is the hardest structure in the body. It's actually stronger than our bones. But once there's bacteria, there's carbohydrate, they form acid. And acid will leach the enamel and make it soft. And then that's where the holes come in. And for those who have sensitive teeth? For those who have sensitive teeth... Why do they have sensitive teeth? Because the their teeth has been leached out over the years. Speak English, please. When I say leached, it's, um, <laughs> the acid has worked on it. So it doesn't have... like that, When I said things like fluoride. Okay. That's why the um, teeth, toothpaste for sensitive teeth, because they have a higher fluoride okay. that will help remineralize the teeth because oh. the minerals in the teeth have been removed over the years so the teeth is now sensitive well 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 there's still plenty to learn about these <laughs> this mouth of ours yes you know and it brings to my mind that uh, radio commercial um something something how does it uh, fight cavities does it use it's kung fu <laughs> <laughs> I think that, well, that, I mean, that brought home the point, yes. you know. Thank you very much, Dr. Abimbola Odushota, dental surgeon and General Secretary Association of Private Dental Practitioners in Nigeria and also a certified nutrition coach. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Thank you very much for coming to tell us how to care for our teeth. And not have body and mouth odor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We <laughs> shall now have the... Home, home stretch. stretch with ship uh, <laughs> if you think that's the artist of the week happy to disappoint you who is the artist of the week today um, it's a certain gentleman whom I used to know many years ago, a comedian, you an don't know actor. Him anymore. Ah, well, I begin to wonder, because I've not seen him in about 30 years. Mm. So, um, Brosy. <laughs> <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> 
Just pray for me. Pray for me. Benka. See this one that you've lost him in a while. You've forgotten my name. I need prayer. <laughs> But I, I was just saying that I saw you last in 1444. <laughs> uh, which century was that? That was just before Lord Lugard which Lord decided Lugard. <laughs> in 1444. <laughs> <laughs> he decided before he, whether or not he was going to come to the before, world. Before he decided to come to, uh, before he decided to be born to come to Africa. <laughs> oh, okay. That was the last time I saw you. He was not born at that time nah, yet. Nah, 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 on nah. that trip. Nah. On the birth on which he made the trip. <laughs> Even <laughs> young. <laughs> you are confusing me. No, I want to confuse your confusion. <laughs> <laughs> the third. Good to see you. It's, it's always my pleasure to, to be here. I've been here once, I think, with you. And the other studio. The other studio. Yes, and, yes. And it's always a pleasure. That was uh, f about 50 years ago. Mm, 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 mm. Not 1444. Before the amalgamation. <laughs> <laughs> Benga Dinika, mm. you are the most traveled Nigerian that I know. Ah, let me connect. Okay, let me tell you why I travel. Mm. It's a hunger inspired project. <laughs> you know, uh, my, my mother would say that. I'll translate that to English. The, the person that is working, that is working hard, hardly finds it, um, hardly finds something to eat. Not to talk of the person sitting there in one place and expecting manna to fall from heaven. So one of the things I learned from my mother is the value of hard work. Manna used to fall in those days. It doesn't, it doesn't fall anymore. <laughs> Maybe. Mm. What manna, today, what, the only manna you see is the manna of... What manna the, of... Manna? What manna of hunger <laughs> will you go through? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the inspiration... I, I, I have to say this to you. We haven't seen it in a while, but I have to say this to you. Um, your industry is felt more in urban Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Lagos, Port Harcourt, Abuja... Abuja. Abuja those major cities in the, in the country. But you tend to take it to those, con those communities, I would say, where people hardly would be able to afford to see a Benga Day in car on stage mm -hmm. or an AY on any stage. So I have to say kudos to you for that. Thank you very Taking, much. I mean, it's, it's pretty much, it, whatever inspired it, call it hunger, <laughs> but I would say fate because the, kind, the, the, the quantum of depression that has been diffused as a result of those things, I just wonder. I said Mr. Depression came to Nigeria. He became depressed. Eh? Mr. Depression will go for a Came to Nigeria, he became depressed. Mm -hmm. See, I, I keep telling people that thank God for, for entertainment, football, Nollywood movies, a comedy, sports and all that. I, I, I can't imagine what it would be like if, if we didn't have all that gingeriness. And most importantly, thank God for social media. Because a lot of things that should have resulted into a lot of brouhaha end up being laughed over, you know? Uh, I was telling somebody that I guess this is why uh, the person that wrote the national anthem knew things were going to be a little bit tough like this before it gets better. That's why I ended it with, so help me God. You know, it's... <laughs> the national pledge. The national pledge, sorry. <laughs> you, you, you know, it's, it's sometimes you, you just want to go crazy. Then you see something that makes you just laugh. Or just say, well, I can't come and go and kill myself. Me only one of my life and die. You know, I cannot come and go and die. You know, so it's... But Nigeria, like I always tell everybody, is the best country in the world. Mm. Say, you can say that again. Whether you like it or not. Mm. It's, only, it's only in Nigeria you can wake up with one naira in your pocket and sleep in Bologna. It's only in Nigeria you can wake up not knowing what to eat and you, you get food. up, you go to like 3501 base <laughs> and you pack the rice and take home. <laughs> 
for a number of days. <laughs> for a number of days, you know. So Ni Nigeria is just unique. We're just different. That's why my my trade thrives in this country. You know, it's interesting you talk about depression and uh, how even depression was frustrated. I, I saw something on someone's uh, WhatsApp status, and it made me go look at suicide figures. The top ten figures of uh, the most societal nations in the world, Nigeria is not there. It can't be there. The least so suicidal nations in the world, Nigeria is not there. I can't be there. I'm wondering, <laughs> so where are we? It's, that's not to say things aren't getting, you See, know. Things are not as rosy as we want, we want it to be. But I tell you something. I, I had a joke back in the days about... Um, um, someone coming to try to recruit people to be suicide bombers in Nigeria, and the last guy he met said, me, I will carry bomb. He said, yes. I will kill myself. He mm. said, yes. I will die. He said, yes. <laughs> die, die, die. <laughs> he said, yes. Hey, Then he went to, he went to the, to the north. He said, Kai, I give you, but said, Kai, I kill myself? Say yes. Who, who, you give me money? He say yes. Who will go show for the money? <laughs> exactly. Right? Good question. Good question. Then Iran went to the east and said, I'll give you a bomb. You kill yourself. You kill a lot of people. They will give your family the money. The guy said, no, I have a better idea. You say there's a bomb. He say yes. There's money. He say yes. You, you give me the money. I, give, you give me the bomb. They give my family the money. He says, and I have a better suggestion. <laughs> Why don't we give the bomb to my family? <laughs> <laughs> Let them give kill me the money. They give me the money. <laughs> but I, I don't know. <laughs> we, we have a few cases here and there, here and there. But I doubt that the average Nigerian would want to kill himself. But then things are tough. We, are, talk, we have talk, to understand that. Tell yeah. us about, you know, first of all, what's the. That, 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 that's your laugh out. Laugh matters. Laugh matters in the various cities. How many cities do you cover? cover okay, uh, yearly we do five cities. Okay. What, what brought it about? Simple. Um, I, I realized about 12, 13 years ago that everybody must have a legacy when you're dead and gone. Some, you must be remembered for something. And I felt just being popular in Lagos, I'd, I'd had the, the good fortune of working all over the nation, the 36 states of Nigeria. And I kept, something kept dragging at my heart, asking me, what would you be remembered for? What would you be remembered for? And that was the era of, area, area, worry, worry, you know, for worry. So I decided, why don't I build the comedy sector in this part of the divide? So we started the Laugh Matters Southwest Comedy Tour with Donna Okuta. Uh, okay, we first start, we, yearly we start in Ibadan, from Ibadan, we move to Oshogbo, we move to Adoe Kiti, we've done Ijebu, we close in Abe Okuta, but this year we're having what we call Lagos at last, <laughs> after donkey years, we're doing Lagos, but what, what, I wanted a platform that would give young generals the opportunity to grow. The, I, I've always believed that you don't necessarily have to come to Lagos to be big. And 12 years down the line, I dare say that we've built so many generals and they, they are comfortable in their skin. They are comfortable walking where they are. In fact, a few of them are coming to have their shows in Lagos now and go back. Dr. Smiler had a show a couple of days ago, some other people. So for me, it was a desire to build another segment of the industry mm -hmm. and I think 12 years down the line God has been good to us yeah but, but, but Benga are those generals getting enough to sustain themselves in those localities you'll be surprised you know what what we what I started doing was taking premium quality entertainment the way it was with all the lights and all that the first two years it was like I was crazy because we were not making money but you see people followed and my philosophy is if you he keep hitting your head against the wall even the wall, the wall one day will say we'll make this guy no go kill himself on my neck may, may I, I just fall. break <laughs> may, may I just, I just fall, fall. leave her my beg I beg I beg <laughs> so I think with consistency 
we will get there. <laughs> you might not make as much as people in Lagos will make, okay. but you are not, you don't have the same overhead yeah. as people in Lagos. Yeah. So yeah. it's like I'm a banker in a bank in Lagos. I'm getting the same salary in Abe Okuta or Ilori or Ushobo. I'm living like a king. Let me let me sure. provoke you. If you provoke me, we go fight, though. No, no, no. Okay, don't be that provocation. Wait, if I okay. provoke you, you will be provoked. <laughs> okay. Simple. <laughs> uh, it, I, I have been very curious. You have traveled across Nigeria, as you have said. How about the North? What's comedy like in the North? I, I, I hear some snippets of comedy from uh, about Northerners. And it's very, very exciting for me. You know, comedy is very, very, very rich in the North. But you see, we all have our cultural differences, uh, our, unique, our unique cultures. Um, then security has also done a lot of this favor mm -hmm. to, the, to events generally in the North. You generally won't find people sitting now, but there are amazing comedians from the north. There is um, um, there is uh, the guy who, pre who behaves like the president, yes. uh, MC oh, okay. Tuaguay. There is my brother who is always in a lot of the commercials. Skits. Okay. You know, we have people in skits. If you see the skits coming out of the north, but you see one thing we have to get right. I I, I keep telling my colleagues that one thing we should always preach is for peace and unity in Nigeria. Because we are the first victims of disunity, insecurity, and all that. Because, like they say in local parlance, now who chop belly full? Or who they safe? Go come talk, say, he won't come watch your show. You know? So if things are safe, if things are sound, you'll be surprised. In the east, in the north, in the mid belt, I don't, they don't call it middle belt anymore. It's, mid, uh, it's mm -hmm. north central. North central. Please, north and central. No, 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 no. North central. It's not north. No, 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 no. No, no, <laughs> no, no. It's a long course. No. Wow, wow. Yes. Wow. So, you know, by, by the time we can get a semblance of peace, you'll be surprised. And it's not just the comedy industry. You'll be surprised how vibrant the spirit of the Nigerian is. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised at what innovation will come out of this country. Benga, I have noticed that there are a lot of comedians around now. It's like uh, they're, they're just crawling out of the woodwork. <laughs> um, and I know that you older comedians have done a lot to encourage these young ones to come on board mm -hmm. and sometimes you actually give up jobs so that they can get jobs. Mm -hmm. Is there really enough job to go around? <sighs> there are over 200 million people, I'm told. In Lagos, I'm told we're about 21 million people. Mm -hmm. Let's do a law of average. Um, if 1% if of 21 million people get married on a Saturday, there's enough job to go around. <laughs> All you just have to do percent of 21 million. <laughs> is just be faithful to your art. I tell, I tell my younger colleagues, be faithful to your art. Okay, back in the days, if I come across, I say, ah, I'm a comedian, oh, please. If there's any opportunity for me to showcase what I have, I'll mm. really appreciate it. Mm. But now the, the, the refrain is, ah, bros, I'm a comedian, oh, I beg, if any show they would if you pay your guy, oh, I know my, your guy broke, oh, that is the that's the kind of mindset we have now. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, don't chase the money. If you keep chasing the money, you keep chasing. Chase your art. Money will chase you. Says, I understand that. Money is chasing you now. Ah, uh, no, I'm saying. Says the man who said he, he, was, he had a hunger-inspired project. Yes, so hunger you. No, but the truth of it is that. No, of course you, I understand what you're saying. Uh, if you Just... put money first, more often than not, mm. than not, rather, you will then... Um, end up disappointed just, dis just you get disappointed we have about 30 seconds or so to go what's next to be expected from being at the first he will play he will plans to fail he will fails to plan plans to fail i have a couple of projects
like the Lagos at last I told you, we have to conclude the tour in Abe Okuta in October. We call October and October to remember. But by and large, I, I'm looking at a situation where, you know, every time we use comedy as, as an attachment, I'm looking at us having a comedy TV station, a comedy radio station. There's Comedy Central. There is um, 32 FM in Ibadan. Who says God can do it? Mm. That's a question. I asked you a question. You use a question to answer it. <laughs> I'm a Yoruba man now. Mm. Mm. Well, is Benga Adeka. Just answer question with question. <laughs> <laughs> Uludu. <laughs> Find X and you circle it. <laughs> CX. Yeah. CX up here. Who will define me that? Max is another issue for another day. I, I would have said that, Jopu, but we have only 30 seconds. <laughs> we have to thank you very much for being here today, being a comedian, actor, writer, and grand com no, 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 comedian of the Federal Republic. Grand comedian. Grand comedian ah, of, Nigeria. Of, of Nigeria. My book is almost ready. I will invite you for the, for the lunch. Yes. GCON. Okay. CFR. And That's GCON. what I told the president when last I saw him. That the reason they invited me for this job is because they know that only a GCON can stand and face a GCF. <laughs> and afterwards, I said, Hey, John Torio, long, now play with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Vega, for Okay, being and that's our show for today. Thank you very much for staying with us. Hope you enjoyed yourself and hope that we shall see you. No, hope that you shall see us again <laughs> next week. When we bring you a fresh edition, I'm Alero Edu. Bye-bye. Stay true to you. I'm Ayo Makine. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend.